Good evening, everyone. We're just uh, waiting for a couple more moments while we uh, allow other folks to join. Uh, we had an emergency or special uh, Mon Vernon school board meeting. Uh, we went a little bit over, so we're just going to give a couple more minutes, giving everyone the opportunity to uh, to, to join us. All right, everyone, we're going to uh, get started at 6.07. Today is uh, August the 27th. This is our first uh, regular uh, non-special uh, SAU 39 school board meeting. Uh, in the, the room with me today is only Christine Landwell, our assistant superintendent. Uh, and so we're going to do a special roll call to uh, make sure that uh, everyone is uh, going to answer their two questions. Number one, that it was unreasonable and uh, based on the emergency situation that we find ourselves in, that the state uh, finds it unreasonable to attend in person this evening, as well as that you were in the room alone. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and just do a roll call in the order that uh, we've been doing these uh, meetings. Ms. Kuzma? Um, yes, I did find it unreasonable to attend in person, or unable to attend in person, and I am alone. Thank you. Mr. Goff here? I wanted to be in person, but it was unreasonable today, and I am alone. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Beam? Uh, yes, what, what Tom said. Yes. <laughs> yes and yes. Ms. Grunchen? You're muted, Alan. Unreasonable and alone. Thank you. Mr. Cochran? Is Josh not with us this evening? Yeah, no, Josh was not able to attend at all today. Thank you. Mr. Gronstra? There we go. A little challenged. Um, yes, uh, it was not reasonable for me to be there in person, and I am currently in the room alone. Great, thank you. Ms. Facey? Yes and yes. Thank you. Mr. Chen? It was unreasonable for me to attend, attend the meeting, um, and I am alone at the moment, and I hope to be in the evening. Mr. Coughlin? Uh, yes, alone, infeasible, and just got Zoom working again. Great. Ms. Taylor? Yes, I'm in quarantine for traveling to another state, and I'm alone. Thank you. Mr. Torres? Yes, it's unreasonable for me to be there today, and I am alone. Great. Ms. Grund? Yes, it's unreasonable for me to attend in person, and I am alone. Great. Ms. Lawrence? It is unreasonable for me to attend in person, and I am alone. Thank you. Mr. Eckhoff? Unreasonable to attend, and I am alone, and I also just got Zoom working again. Thank you. Ms. Hinckley? Um, it's unreasonable for me to attend in person and I'm alone. And Mr. St. Dennis, is he with us this evening? 
Mr. Attendant, so Dennis is not in attendance. Great, thank you everyone. Um, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna actually start off with uh, public input. If there are any members of the public that would like to uh, address the SAU board, uh, we can go ahead and actually allow you the opportunity to do so. Go ahead and use the raise my hand feature and we'll be limited to a three minute session. Seeing no hands raised uh, from the public, we will uh, we'll move on. There'll be another opportunity at the end of the meeting this evening to also address the board. Uh, now for the superintendent report, Mr. Steele. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a number of updates for the SAU board. Uh, so uh, first and foremost, uh, a big thank you to our, all of the uh, principals, administrators, school teachers, nurses, paraprofessionals, SAU staff, custodians, um, everybody who's uh, working tirelessly to get ready for next next week's uh, beginning of the school year. Um, I think it's fair to say that our, our staff are optimistic, but also feel uh, concerned and are, are uh, hoping to get this right and, and uh, um, are very much concerned about everybody's well-being, including their own, as we would expect. Um, with that said, um, we are working towards uh, all the things we need to do to be ready for next week and uh, look forward to welcoming our, welcoming our students back next year or next week. Um, a few more specific updates. Uh, first, our entire uh, um, reopening plan um, was hinged on our numbers working. And I think I mentioned that was an act of faith on our part in, in, in several cases. Um, and it's largely worked out. One area where it has not that I wanna share about uh, with the SAU board um, that's already been shared with the Amherst School Board is in seventh grade and partially in eighth grade as well. Um, so our issue there is that uh, we have, um, those are our two largest class classes, cohorts of students in our SAU. We've known about this bubble for a while. And um, the class sizes at, the, the physical classroom sizes at AMS um, aren't, don't work with the number of kids that uh, chose the in-person modality. Um, so to be, uh, to be very transparent, um, Dr. Bernasconi has alerted me to this issue a couple of weeks ago that she was concerned that um, we might have an issue there. Um, and it wasn't until uh, yesterday when I went and visited and saw the classes set up and talked with teachers that I uh, fully um, grasped the, the, the issue. So uh, I apologize for me being the one late to the party, but uh, we did make a change in seventh and eighth grade. And uh, the reason I want to share that here is while it's not necessary in any other grade level or school, it's not to say that it isn't going to be an issue in the future or may not be, we just don't know. Um, and so uh, what we've done is we've notified all of our seventh and eighth grade parents of the issue. We've asked for volunteers uh, that are willing to go from in-person to remote for the first segment of the school year. And uh, we've received a few um, of those uh, volunteers. Um, and uh, for future segments, if our numbers are higher than they, than they um, ought to be um, and higher than what we can fit with social distancing, we are going to have a random lottery to move students from the in-person to the remote modality for that segment. Um, we'll do that with the understanding that those kids will be guaranteed an in-person spot for the next segment and for other segments until it cycles back to them, uh, needing if, that, if it needs to happen again. Um, but uh, this is something that, I'm, uh, that I own in being uh, late to the party and recognizing as an issue, but also want uh, to, to say to the community, this is part of us trying to get this right. And uh, um, we hope that this won't be an issue in other places. Um, what we are doing is we're looking at what we can do inside of the school. If there's other places that those classes can be held where a larger class size is appropriate given the classroom space. So this is not an issue with teachers. We have enough teachers um, to teach the students in person. It's, a, it's an issue of social distancing inside those physical classrooms and not having the space um, to do it appropriately. And again, um, until I saw it with my own eyes and saw what it looked like with those classrooms, um, did I not uh, realize that uh, I just felt that it was unsafe and had to make this change. Um, next, uh, regarding our funding for our, all three of our school districts, all three districts have now voted to petition the DOE 
to use our unassigned fund balance to fund our expenditures we need for this uh, school year. Um, we are still waiting that approval from the DOE. Uh, we've been notified that uh, because none of our school districts have passed the contingency fund um, that's available in some other school districts, that the DOE is um, having some uh, uh, question about whether they can make this approval or not. Um, we have uh, worked with our uh, legal counsel. We've reviewed the executive order carefully. We feel strongly that we have um, uh, the, the basis uh, for this application that it should be approved. Um, but we want to be, uh, I want to be clear with you that we don't have it at this time and there's no guarantee we're going to get it. Um, we would argue we've, we've got strong legal basis why we're right in this case, because the contingency fund that, uh, that some believe is the only thing allowable under executive order 38, um, doesn't need, uh, executive order 38 to be used. So it, it doesn't make much sense that the governor's intent uh, was for use of those contingency funds that other districts might have. Um, it seems pretty clear that the governor intended that school districts that had money laying around, like we do, um, should be able to use that for COVID-19 related expenses to start their school years safely. So we're going to push hard for that um, and just want to keep you updated that that's still something in flux and that we might need to have further discussions should we run into a snag with that down the road. So we're again confident, but not 100% by any stretch of the imagination. Um, next, uh, I want to thank uh, Dave Chen and Steve Frades who have been working on a data dashboard uh, with me for all of the, um, the COVID related things that we want to share with the public. Um, they have been working um, tirelessly on um, uh, putting something together that can provide confidence to our community about the information um, that we have and give people uh, the opportunity to see where we stand with, with, various, um, with various metrics. And so uh, I just want to give an idea of what we're working on uh, briefly. This is not exactly what it's going to look like, but we'll give you an idea of that. So we're going to put something on our front page of our website that shows something like this. So overall status and then the various metrics that, that go into that. Um, with with uh, the information that supports them. Um, I will say that, you know, the information um, on here is, is mostly accurate. Uh, the positive cases reported yesterday was eight. Uh, it's 35 today, I will share that, but um, it was eight yesterday. Um, the attendance rate I made up, you know, that, that's not, we don't have school in session quite yet, and the student and staff new cases is something that, that's not an accurate number, but this is an idea of what we would have on our website um, to show the public at a glance. And then um, to show what uh, uh, Dave and, and Steve have been working on, um, and again, this is uh, information that is being put together in concept form, but things like this that, that kind of show where our state is at, and then uh, we'll even have the ability to drill down further into what our attendance rate looks like in our various schools and in our various pods. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sharing this uh, very long on purpose because it's still being built but I want the public to be reassured we're working on that. We want to have that something that's available to our public as we get started. Um, one thing to clarify about data is you'll, you'll note that I mentioned last time that I had a concern that the state was not going to notify us when they became aware of positive cases in our school community. Um, my sense is that the, the governor's office and DHHS have been receiving a lot of uh, uh, con concerned calls from citizens about that uh, issue and we're now uh, feel differently that we will be notified um, about uh, times when a, a student or staff member who's at part of our school community has been in our schools when they've tested positive. And so we will find that information out through our nurses and have the ability to do the contract tracing that we intend to, intend to do that involves notification of classmates, um, teachers, et cetera, about, about what's going on. Certainly we're not going to provide names of individual students or staff members unless DHHS requires us to do so, which is something that's within their purview, um, but not ours. So I just wanted to update um, about that. Um, some, uh, uh, let's see, I've got uh, three more updates and, th and then we're done. In terms of staffing at the SAU level, um, we have uh, not filled the secondary director of curriculum instruction and assessment position, uh, despite uh, all of our uh, uh, valiant efforts to fill that position. 
Um, we've not been able to thus far. A combination of not the right candidate and not the right salary or job title, I think, has contributed to that. And so our, uh, our plan is to hold that position for now, go through the SAU FY22 budgeting process, see where we land, and then revisit that position either in the winter or spring once we know where that position stands in the FY22 um, SAU budget. In the interim, um, we are going to use some of that funding um, to support some of the needs that we have, which is uh, specifically around um, our grants management with a temporary employee and or some help in the business office um, with, a, a, again, another temporary employee. So we'll remain within our budget for FY21, but wanted to let the SEU board know um, that we, we, we um, are not able to survive without some of the roles of that position existing. And although we're not filling it directly, um, we are going to be uh, filling with some temporary employees until we get that straightened out. Um, last two, uh, Porter Dodge has been working on a volunteer program for um, site security for our schools. We anticipate many more of our students and classes to be outdoors using our school sites um, during COVID-19 and the volunteer program that we have is to provide an additional layer of security for the um, for our sites. Um, this was a, 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 a recommendation from some community members and it makes sense to us. And to date, Porter has 39 volunteers for our various schools, um, matches our SAU number as well. So 39 is a lucky number for us. And uh, Porter's working with both Chief Reams and Chief Furlong of our two uh, police departments to go through the background check uh, process, fingerprinting, all of that. Um, those people will be clearly identified with um, clothing that identifies them as, as part of that team. They'll have a radio and be connected to the school and of course will be uh, fully background checked before they, they step foot on campus and wanna thank Porter um, for his work there. And then finally, my last update um, is uh, around athletics. Um, many of our uh, student athletes are very uh, hopeful about an athletic season. And I wanted to update the SAU board where we stand with that uh, as of right now. So um, Kelly Braley is our new athletic director at the high school level. Um, Mike, um, uh, our, Mike Barry, our new principal, and uh, Jeff Wing have all been uh, lobbying for how we can play um, and participate in athletics uh, safely. One key point to remember is that uh, without a school athletic program, not only does our uh, student engagement drop, because we know athletics is a big motivator for our students, but I have a very real concern about our students then going to club, uh, club sports and participating in, in uh in athletics in a different way where we have no ability to ensure the safety and, and the protocols that are in play with athletics. So I am motivated to find a way to do this right and to do this safely. So with that in mind, my plan right now is we're working closely with our neighboring school districts to see what we can do to develop um, opportunities for interscholastic play with protocols in place that are strict and are thorough and provide us um, a, a modicum of reassurance that we're doing these things safely. Um, there are low risk, medium risk, and high risk sports as defined by the NHIAA. And uh, frankly, uh, I would say that uh, our success depend, hinges on our student athletes making good choices with the opportunity we're gonna try to provide them. So while I've not made a final decision yet, I want the SEU board to know it's my intention to find a way to, to have high school um, interscholastic athletics to take place in some form, although likely a diminished form, meaning not full seasons, against all of the uh, opponents throughout the state, but instead some sort of attenuated season that provides some opportunity for interscholastic play, but limits our exposure, uh, particularly to those um, in our nearby communities. So that's still being worked on. Um, I do not expect uh, at the middle school level for there to be much in terms of interscholastic activity, but for us to provide some opportunity for um, either intramural or skill and drill type opportunities for our students that still allows them to participate without increasing our risk level um, in our community. So still working through that and more to come as we get closer to the official start of the athletic season. Um, but those, that was a lot there, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I'm happy to provide any answers to questions the board might have. Thank you. Thank you. And as a reminder to all board members, if you'd like to ask a question, just use the raise my hand feature. We'll start off with Ms. Facey. Yeah, Adam, on the athletics, have you made a determination on practices yet, um, particularly at the high school? 
Yeah, the season will start on uh, September 8th, I believe if I'm and and Kelly Braley, let me know if I'm if I'm wrong on that date. I still believe that's still the the date when teams would be allowed to practice. Um, so we'll make a decision uh, by then at the absolute latest and hopefully at least a week before that. Um, but I, again, that's dependent on us being able to nail down exactly what our season might look like. And I, I did just get confirmation that September 8th is the right start of that date. So I, I'm, I'm trying. Our teams are able to do some limited working out right now. and They've been doing that. So they're not sitting idle right now, but it's certainly not official practicing yet. Thank you. Any more questions from uh, my fellow board members? Seeing no hands raised, uh, Mr. Superintendent, just uh, a very quick question from me uh, with regards to the email system. I know uh, we've encountered some issues over the last uh, two weeks with regards to emails going directly to junk bins for parents and students. Was there something fundamentally changed about the way we're broadcasting emails? Um, and if so, uh, is it something that we can potentially rectify or send out some communication to parents to say, hey, this is something that you're gonna to need to work on on your end in order to receive SEU emails? Yeah, thank you for that. So uh, most of the issue we've had there has been when the, the power school system itself has been emailing parents directly. Um, as you know, as we moved to power school, every parent needed to log into power school and they needed to do that um, uh, by receiving emails from the system. And uh, some uh, email systems, Yahoo in particular, and Hotmail as another, um, were marked many of our emails as spam. Um, we don't have the, we certainly don't control uh, how they classify our emails, um, but unfortunately that, that is something that happened. One thing that uh, Alex uh, Stone did is instead of using our own email servers, uh, we purchased a third party email delivery service that um, uses a reputation-based approach that should uh, increase our reputation as long as parents don't mark us as spam uh, when they receive it in their email system. Um, so we have done that and put that into practice um, about a week ago. And so I'm hoping that's made a little bit of a difference. But um, unfortunately, we, uh, we don't have control over uh, how uh, other email systems classify our, our outgoing emails. Thank you. Mr. Eckhoff? Thanks, Steve. Um, Pat, I'm just wondering what the status of the busing numbers were um, in the contract. Are we going to have to run all the routes all the time? Do we have an idea of how many uh, kids are going to be brought to school by their parents instead? Um, if so, if we have bus routes with only five kids on them, are we still going to have to run those routes? Can we condense? I know it's early in the ball game, but is there any sense of what our bus loads are going to look like and is there an opportunity to reduce that if the numbers are really really low yeah thank you for that so first of all we uh we did ask parents to to select what their primary pickup and drop off plan would be and so unlike previous years it will um, only people who have selected to use the bus will be allowed to so in years past we picked up whoever's been at the bus stops and brought them to school we're not doing that right now because we're limiting the number of people that can be on the bus. And although we've not had to do it so far, um, if we have to limit um, who can ride the bus to those who fall within the statutory requirement for bus transportation, which is uh, students in grades K through eight who live more than two miles from the school, we will do that. Um, our our uh, bus company is working on bus routes even as we speak, they have all the data from uh, parents who made this segment one, um, filled out that form last week, and they're working through all of the routes um, to build them with times and to make sure that they're uh, evenly balanced and have only one kid per seat, um, except for siblings that can sit together, that sort of thing. Um, and they're hoping to have that published by this, uh, I, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's uh, this Friday have routes published. Michelle, I can't see you, but is that? either be uh, available um, Friday or Saturday, but we'll get them published as soon as they are available. They are going to be running um, sort of a dry run of the routes tomorrow, and we'll be tweaking it from, from there. And then along with that, I think it's uh, important to note, first of all, um, we're doing a pretty extensive video update for the community tomorrow with a lot of details in it. One thing that uh, the, the, the community will find out tomorrow, but I'm happy to share now is um, every student who's selected in person for segment one 
is going to receive an, a, a name tag in the mail that, uh, that, that is basically their ticket to enter the school. So in other words, uh, we're going to be checking students as they arrive to make sure they have their name tag, which uh, is helpful for several reasons. First of all, it allows us to make sure that this, that child's parent has gone through the process to review the protocols, sign off on the policy, all of that. Second, um, it helps us identify students because we're gonna color code them um, at different schools for different purposes. And third, helps us with names because remember, we're not going to be seeing kids' faces. Um, we're going to be having a more difficult time recognizing students um, without seeing their faces. And so those are being mailed home tomorrow. Um, and uh, I already know, I'll head off a question at the pass. We've already worked with the local postmaster to make sure uh, those name tags are, are not put through uh, the Manchester sorting facility and will be delivered directly um, between Saturday and Monday. Um, so that, that, that shouldn't be an issue. And then we'll have a new name tags for each segment that uh, notify or signify that uh, that, that particular student is, is permitted to join the um, in-person on-campus environment. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, great question. Um, Elizabeth Kuzma. Um, so uh, kind of back up to that, but the busing questions. Um, I've caught wind that people were not necessarily aware that the question on the power school about the buses, um, there's some questions about whether that was a survey or an opt in, like the way it was worded. Um, so we might run into some issues, especially for segment one, where parents didn't select that option, but just assumed that they could take the bus um, because it was more of a, they took it more as a survey um, versus a definite kind of a, the way it was worded. Um, we had the, I think we've got the same issue with the um, eight o'clock thing at Clark Wilkins. So they they're taking it more as like oh is it a survey versus a uh opting into the program so just a heads up yeah and we are when we can we're what we're going to do is is parents that want to use the bus and didn't select that um as part of the form um we're going to put them on a wait list if there's room so we're going to accommodate parents when we can but we're um and and i understand uh parents might have seen it as a survey but we were pretty clear that um, this is, if, if you plan, if you intend to use the bus at all this year, we need you to tell us that. Okay. Uh, so, uh, we're, we know that there are some issues like that floating around. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Mr. Gauthier. Uh, this is probably maybe a, a bit of a question for Michelle Adam, but certainly a, a question for you. Aside from the, um, funding not being passed by the DOE or not the, the application not being passed by the DOE yet. Are there any other major obstacles that we face in terms of actually opening as planned next week? And, and the first thing I think of is um, safety equipment for staff and everybody that's going to be in the buildings. Yeah, Michelle, I, I, my understanding is that we have all the PPE we need to start the school year, but Michelle, correct, please correct the record if I'm wrong. Yes, that is, that is correct. So we, we did move forward with the PPE orders and um, in some cases we ordered half a year so that we would have ample supplies but not um, expend resources that we didn't need to just yet. But from that perspective, we are good to go. Thank you. Thank you. And Ellen, just before I get to, to you, Adam, can you just quickly just address real fast uh, in terms of your interactions with faculty and staff this week. I know uh, a lot of folks have been coming back. What's the overall sentiment amongst uh, our employees about getting started and um, feeling ready to, uh, to, to go next week? Well, uh, um, we had um, an emotional welcome back. I think that's the, the fairest way to describe it. Um, our staff care uh, deeply about kids. Um, they care deeply about our schools. Many of them live in town and have children either in our schools or have been in our schools and are deeply connected um, to what our schools are trying to do. And um, there is a wide mix of emotions that our faculty have sometimes at the same time. Some are excited and scared out of their mind at the exact same time. Um, some are uh, fearful but uh, confident. Um, others are uh, very comfortable and it, there's, there's everything in between. Um, and uh, uh, I've, 
um, done my best to connect with as many as possible. It's, it's a little harder and um, with how we're doing things right now, but um, I am so impressed with our staff. They are being selfless. Um, they're being smart. Uh, they're being um, wise about their choices. And um, one of the, it's a, it's a new normal for sure for us to be, um, you know, there were several staff that um, started to give me a hug and we both kind of realized we, you know, we can't do that right now. And we're going to put that in the, the post COVID piggy bank for a, a hug down the road kind of thing. So um, I, I really commend our faculty and staff because they are uh, selfless is the right, I think is the best word to describe it. Um, they are not thinking of themselves, but they're thinking of what they need to do to make our school year successful. Um, so, but I think it's, it's very fair to say that there are a wide range of emotions and um, some of it is we just need to get, we need to get through the first couple of days and, and show ourselves that we can do it safely and um, that it'll work. Um, and part of it is that we, we need to figure out, are we, what can we learn from these first few days that we can make better in future segments of our school year? So um, Christine, um, others, what am I missing from what I've said? Is other other things you would add from what uh, you've interacted with staff this week? Um, the only thing I would add is that um, staff has, have really appreciated these days. They've said how productive it's been and how it's been so wonderful for them to collaborate with their colleagues. It's been interesting. It's an adjustment. Some people are in the building um, and others are remote and we've still been able to bring everyone together. So they've been um, really positive and productive days. Awesome, thank you. Ellen. Can you give us an update on the Clark Wilkins eight o'clock drop off option? Is that happening or did we, um, did we sign that up to new mornings? Um, so I need Anna for that, unfortunately. Um, she has worked extensively with new mornings. Um, the new mornings program is gonna happen at the, the Wilkins and Clark sites. So I can confirm that. Um, there is still the eight o'clock drop off option and uh, Anna has worked on that directly to make that something that, uh, well, I want to I want to hesitate to say this. I I think she made some made it work out in a way that's uh, um, that work that's going to work very well for parents. But I'm going to leave that to Anna to announce that to her community because I just don't know the details off the top of my head. Tom, She's, do you have them? Yeah, she sent out an email uh, oh, earlier you. tonight. Um, just bear with me while I find it. But if I remember correctly. In the email, it said that um, at seven o'clock, they can start dropping off with new mornings. Um, you will be in new mornings between seven um, and 9.15, but you'll only be with students in new mornings in the gym that are in your pod. So you'll be segregated from other students that aren't in your pod. Uh, and uh, kids that are dropped off at eight o'clock by parents um, will go straight to their classrooms and they'll have independent work time and, and time to hang out in their classroom, which will be supervised by um, support staff, I believe was the, tech, the terminology in the, um, in the email directly, but that did go out today, uh, this afternoon, sometime around uh, 3.30, 4 o'clock, 3.22. Great. Thanks, Adam and Tom. Thank you. And, and there is aftercare as well. Not as many details on that for time, but I presume it's, um, they said to contact New Mornings because um, they will follow the district safety and cleaning protocols as well. Thanks, guys. Stephanie Grant. Um, Adam, so if the DOE doesn't approve the funding, what does plan B look like? Does that mean we don't have the funds for the PPE, for the UV robots, those things we need to clean and make our schools safe and we might have to close for a while till we get funding or what? We haven't worked through it yet. <laughs> no, no, we have. So, uh, thank you for that question. And, uh, some of you might be wondering why we would go the DOE route and, and not ask voters directly through the use of a special meeting. Um, so uh, in, in normal circumstances, my recommendation would always be make sure we're talking to voters directly and getting their approval uh, for, uh, for the use of, of funds. There, there's no doubt about that. That's always my, uh, my default. Um, in this case, where there's an executive order from the governor that deals with this issue directly, and we don't need to raise additional tax dollars to fund uh, our schools. Um, and given that it's next week, 
um, I think it makes sense to be uh, attempting to use the, the tools in front of us um, to make this happen. Um, with that said, if the DOE rejects our um, request, um, I would be looking to our school board um, to give me authorization to work uh, in several different fronts. Uh, the first would be um, to work through the political angle and clarify with our governor's office and ask for a revision to the exact emergency order because I believe the intent of the emergency order is to do exactly what we're asking to do and that there is a, a, a bureaucratic um, dispute about what the intent was. And so I would ask the easiest thing would be for the governor to clarify that in, in his emergency order. Um, if that was not successful, um, I would ask us to file for an injunctive relief through the superior court where they where we would ask the court to clarify what the emergency order means and to clarify for the DRA and the DOE um, that we're, that our request should be approved and be directed to be approved by the superior court. And at the same time, if we get to that point, I would ask that we'd also in, in lieu of, or in, in if, um, and if the superior court doesn't find that, that they would then approve the use of special meetings uh, for our school districts um, to raise and appropriate those funds as quickly as possible. However, we know that there's a lag of several months with special meetings, it takes time. And so uh, we have what we need to start the school year, but I would say that we would have to think about that we do not have the funding to remain open for the entire school year without additional funding. I don't see how we can keep our schools open without the additional funding that we're requesting. If we could, we wouldn't be asking for it. That's kind of a, I think that should be obvious that we're not looking to spend funds uh, for any other reason, but we need them in order to run our school year safely this coming school year. Um, and for expenses that there's no way we could have predicted this past January and February. So uh, we would be in a position where we'd have to make a plan for closing our schools um, and going to the fully remote option or going to status red if we're gonna use our own naming convention for a significant portion of the school year because of the lack of funds to remain open. But that's, that's my thinking about it. Um, uh, and uh, the, the last option I should mention is there's also in lieu of a special meeting, it's possible next March to have on ballots what's called a deficit appropriation. A deficit appropriation is when a school district thinks that in their current fiscal year, they're going to come up short and they ask voters to approve at the, at the regular district meeting, the annual meeting, to raise those additional funds for the prior fiscal year, which is at that time, the current fiscal year. The, 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 the very real difficulty about that is that we're in March. If the voters vote that down, we don't have time to not, we don't have enough time to not spend money between March and the end of the school year to make sure that we're covered because remember, it is illegal for us to spend $1 more than what the voters have approved for us. Thank you. Tim? Adam, um, so thank you for that. But one of the things that I see is um, missing a little bit from that explanation is, well, I, first of all, I would imagine that the DOE is getting multiple requests because of the executive order. Uh, would that be fair to say? It is fair to say, but we're unique in one regard. Um, I'll let you finish your question. And maybe your question is part of that. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I'll, uh, my next question will um, segue right into that, which is based on that, um, what is the probability of having the request granted? Um, that's a, a little bit of a fool's errand because I can only get that wrong. If I say 70%, you know, either way I'm going to be. So, uh, uh, I, I do believe that the DOE is trying to, to, to find a way to approve our requests. Um, they need to do it legally because um, it, it's possible that uh, if, a, if a taxpayer was thought that we violated the executive order somehow, we would all be in the same boat uh, together with the DOE defending that action. So they're, they're working with the Attorney General's office directly uh, to make sure that, uh, that they're in the clear to approve it. So I think the intent is for them to approve it. Um, what's, what's unique about us, um, is, um, the, the other districts, as I've understood, um, that have made the request, 
um, have a contingency fund that's been established as part of the, the uh, previous annual budgeting process. Um, and a contingency fund is similar to what selectmen can do every year at tax setting. Selectmen have always had the ability to, when they've had an unassigned fund balance, to apply that to a contingency fund and have it sit there. Um, it's called retainage in selectmen's terms and then used in future years either, either for an emergency or for another appropriation. Selectmen can't use it without approval from the voters or from uh, the Department of Red Revenue Administration in an emergency situation. School districts until about, gosh, I think, I don't know how many years ago, five or six years ago, did not have the ability to do that. There was no such thing as retainage on the school side. Um, but the law changed, again, I don't know exactly the date, but I think about five or six years ago that allowed school districts to do that if they wanted to. That requires um, two things to happen. First, the voters to approve it at an annual meeting to set up that contingency fund. And then for a school board to vote to set some uh, unassigned fund balance aside for those contingency funds. Um, I have never been a fan of those contingency funds on the school district side because uh, philosophically, a town has to collect the taxes and there's no guarantee that they're able to collect the taxes. Some people don't pay, some people are delinquent or late, et cetera. Um, school districts are guaranteed to get their tax revenue from the town. If the town's short on money, the town's required by law to borrow money to be able to give it to us on time. So we don't ever have a cash flow issue um, with, with tax collection and thus a contingency fund to me feels like we're holding taxpayer dollars for no real reason when we could be reducing those, reducing taxes. So I've never recommended in any of my districts we set up those contingency funds. But in this case, every other district who's required this uh, request under the executive order number 38 has had a contingency fund. And so by default, the AG's office and the DOE, DOE have assumed that that was a requirement. But our argument is you don't need that executive order to use a contingency fund. It already exists for emergencies such as the one we're in right now with COVID-19. So the executive order would be moot, except for the procedural change that's included in the executive order that speeds up the timeline for approval. So we think we have, again, for lots of reasons, we think we have a solid a solid case, but, um, and that's probably a lot more technical information than you, you probably were interested in hearing, but um, that's, that's the story. No, I, I think that's great information, actually, and I appreciate it. Um, I guess maybe a, a better question would be how many SAUs are there that you're aware of that are in a similar situation uh, as, as we are? I'm, I'm told that we are the first to make this request of the, without a contingency fund. I don't know if there have been others since us, but I know that we are plowing new ground from the DOE's perspective. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Adam. We're gonna move along now on to our agenda. Um, I believe we're gonna to go to our consent agenda here. Just a moment, let me pull it up. Stand corrected, we're gonna to go to our committee reports. Uh, Ms. Facey, did you wanna report on the um, facilities committee? Sure, yeah, we just had a meeting right before this meeting um, and we um, provided an update on the Amherst and Sohegan School Board's uh, meetings that just took place. Um, we also got a, uh, our, a review of the Amherst Middle School and Clark Wilkins uh, proposals um, on uh, renovations that are being proposed at AMS and um, a possible addition and um, as one option and a new school as another option at uh, Wilkins. Um, we directed the uh, architects and engineers to go back and do some uh, cost estimating. Uh, we'll be receiving those within a couple of weeks and we'll have a meeting at that point to be able to go through um, the work with costs that are associated with with that so this is late breaking news about 
an hour ago. So that's where right. we stand. Thanks, Amy. Yep. Does anyone have any questions for Amy and the Joint Facilities Committee? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Kuzma, did you want to report any updates on the policy committee? Yes. Um, so we're going to be um, in your next board packet. We're going to have all of the policies that we've worked on over the summer. Um, although we didn't get to start the policy season as early as we'd expected because of COVID. Um, we still worked our tails off over the summer and got through, I don't even know how many um, policies, I think at least 40, <laughs> at least probably more. Um, but um, we got through them. Um, that we are, we have finally moved into the policy season that we've been talking about for about two years. Um, so we reviewed them all. You'll see them in your next board packet um, to review. And then we'll go from there um, and we'll be, I believe in March, we'll be announcing the next round of um, policies. Yes, I got a thumbs up on that one. The next round of policies in March um, that we'll be reviewing as part of the policy season. At that point, if there's, um, you know, we're kind of doing them by letter, um, but also throwing in any other ones that we feel need to be done, they come up from the NHSBA updates and things like that. So uh, make sure that you come prepared um, at the next meeting um, with what's in the board packet to ask questions and stuff like that so that we can review it at that time because we're not going to go through each one individually because we'll be here all night. Because um, like I said, there's at least 40. Um, but definitely feel free um, to you know come out with questions and things like that um, about specific policies um, if you have any about them so any questions from any board members with regards to the policy committee seeing none uh, excuse me i do have a quick question with regards to covid related policies yes. is the state uh, school board association uh, offering any ideas or strategies about policies that we should be modifying beyond the ones that we've already done? Um, so are you guys entertaining those for our next discussion? Yeah, so there's a couple in there that are definitely related um, to COVID. The rest of them, we've actually been able to work into the policy that we all just approved. Um, I'm assuming, you know, that we reviewed at our last SAU meeting, and I believe have probably been approved at all the boards at this point. Um, so there's a couple, but there actually isn't significant amounts of need um, across the board um, for a lot of policies. Um, I think they, there'll be some that we might put into place later, maybe. Um, but really, we have, um, I think there's two off the top of my head. There really wasn't a lot um, that you guys will see in the board packet that you can tell are definitely directly related to the need for COVID. Great. Thank you, Beth. And David Chen's got a question. Yes. Yeah, um, this is just a reminder. We had talked before about policies. I don't, I, I don't remember if this was at the Sahigan board or at this board, but a contextual, you know, what the context of the changes that are made in the policies would be very helpful because, you know, sometimes you read these things that are totally new, but they followed some change history that you know, we, we can't necessarily easily reconstruct. So um, I would just like to ask that we put a little bit of effort into the context of uh, what is being changed on and why, um, what is be, being changed and why the changes are being made so that we can uh, read them a little easier. Thank you. Great, and Beth, just to piggyback on that, maybe we can highlight in the policies, the 40 that we're gonna get in September, uh, like a little bullet point, maybe in italics or underline what was changed, just so it can be uh, brought to uh, our attentions uh, a little bit more smoother and easier. I will, I think Steve just raised his hand and this is- You offered to do it. <laughs> Steve, yeah. that's very kind of yeah. you. Yeah, I promised to do that for Dave at the Sahigan board and uh, I did not anticipate the volume we would be doing in one shot, but 
uh, I'll try and do something and you can all benefit from my rash promise to Dave. You're awesome, because I was going to try to sit down. Maybe we can divide and conquer, Steve. Well, don't call me awesome until I get something done. I was going to say, because it's a <laughs> lot to go through. Thank you for recognizing the amount of work. Yeah. Thank um, you, Steve. We can talk. We can talk about that. <sighs> Stephanie Grun. Can I just ask that we have those policies sent out early so we have time to read them, them all, too? So... It's not like three days or four days before. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I will add that the Trello board for policies, each one of them has an extensive history in every single policy of what changes were made and, the, and actually the conversation that was had amongst um, committee members. So if you really wanted to do a deep dive, you could start that anytime. Um, it's all there actually, um, which is available to anybody. Um. Yeah, because we because we were remote for a lot of this, a lot of it was done through Trello itself. So there's notes. Um, you'll see a lot of notes within the comment area of the of each individual policy card, and then you'll also see um, various. Some of them have like three or four edits, and we track each one of them um, as we go. They each just kind of get uploaded, and then the most recent. Um, is in there. I know that Abby is going through it right now um, just to kind of say, okay, this is the final one that we're working on. She's just kind of relabeling um, the correct document within each card um, because I've been getting a lot of emails this week from Trello. So, um, but she, they're pretty much done. Um, so yeah, Trello is a great tool to use for all of that. Um, seeing no additional questions and no other committee uh, reports for tonight, let's move on to the consent agenda. Um, I'm going to entertain a motion to approve consent agendas number one, two, three, four, five. We're going to pull number six and pull number seven for discussion and then uh, number eight. So one through five and number eight for consent uh, agenda items. If someone would like to make a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. First is by Steve, second is by Beth. Uh, any discussion? I, I have some corrections to uh, the uh, eight ten minutes, number two. Okay. Uh, and I'll just describe them. I've given them to Danae already, so she's aware of them. Um, mostly it's a problem of um, Danae has not met uh, Kim Sarfty yet, so her name is misspelled and she's mistitled a bunch of places in the minutes and I gave her the corrections to those. Awesome. So we're going to make uh, the appropriate uh, amendment to the minutes to list for that. Uh, Laura Taylor. The organizational chart for the year was part of the minutes or part of the consent agenda. Are we going to discuss that or is it just informational purposes? We can uh, pull that for discussion if that's something that you wanted to do, Ms. Taylor. I just don't understand having it in the agenda, what we're voting on, having it on the, as a line item. So if you'd like to discuss it, we can pull it. Did you want to pull it, Ms. Taylor? If anyone else wants to discuss it, I don't need to discuss it alone. Oh, if you want to discuss it, that's enough. <laughs> All right, so let's pull uh, item number three as well for discussion. Steve, uh, is that okay with you in reference to your motion? Yes, I will uh, amend the motion to amend number three. And uh, Beth? I will Would second you? that amendment. Awesome. <laughs> So any further discussion on one, two, four, five, and eight? Hearing none, um, take a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Kuzma? Yes. Mr. Goffier? Yes. Ms. Beam? Ah, Beam, yes. Thank you, Beam. Uh, Ellen uh, had to depart. Uh, Mr. Groschka? Yes. Ms. Facey? 
Yes, yes. Mr. Chen? Chen, yes. Mr. Coughlin? Coughlin, yes. Ms. Taylor? Taylor, yes. Mr. Torres? Torres, yes. Ms. Grund? Grund, yes. Ms. Lawrence? Lawrence, yes. Mr. Eckhoff? Eckhoff, yes. Ms. Hinckley? Hinckley, yes. O'Keefe, yes. Fourteen in favor. No opposed. Let's go back to item number uh, three, consent agenda item number three. Mr. Superintendent, can you address that for us, please? Happy to. So uh, about, I think it was two years ago, the board asked for this to be something that's included about once a year so that there's an update uh, for the board. So uh, every August we have it in our uh, planning document that will provide this to the board just for their reference. Um, so it's nothing more than uh, than simply a, a kind of a routine thing that we'll do every year. And how the SAU office is actually structured and, and formulated, correct? Correct. Ms. Taylor, go ahead. So um, are all of these employees in the SAU budget? Um, let me just verify, but yes yes they are okay so there are 22 employees yes if that's the i'm, I'm assuming you counted right i'm not counting right now but oh, yes. okay yeah, yeah. I, I just um the director of technology was part of the high school and i was just well will that con arrangement continue to be oh network administrator laura is what you're thinking yeah, the, the network administrator um, this past budget cycle was Perfect. removed from the high school budget and placed in the SAU budget and all of the uh, relevant budget committees reviewed that, reviewed that. Okay. Approved it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else, Ms. Taylor? No, thank you. Mr. Chen? Uh, what is the color code? A lot of colors there. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, so. Um, the, the four light green are the senior leadership. Um, the two light blue are kind of at the same level, but are, are not considered senior leadership. Um, orange are, um, just a, 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 I guess one layer down, but it, the color code, it really isn't that significant. I guess it's, it's really what, what, uh. Yeah, there's, there's no real, I guess there's no hard and fast significance to it. Okay. Ms. Grund? All right, one, one quick question. One, maybe just, this is just for me to understand. Um, I didn't know we hired an, an, an HR coordinator. When did, when would she come on board? So, uh, July, she replaced July. someone that was, someone resigned. Yeah, she's a replacement. Oh. Yeah, Maureen, okay. De, Maureen DeGrenier was in that position prior. Oh, that's replacing her. Oh, okay, yes. got it. Um, and this is just for my clarification. Please don't read into it. Okay. <laughs> um, SAU, when, if you're, if you, if an SAU wants to hire additional headcount compared to what they have in one year, isn't there a process that has to go through to ask for additional headcount? Yes, is it? there is. So, um, if we wanted to add, um, uh, so what's what's missing on here is the position that existed last year that's not filled right now, which is that secondary director of curriculum instruction and assessment. That so that, that one head count can be replaced without, you know, just with approval. If it's a certified position, the SAU board needs to approve it. If it's not a certified yeah. position, the superintendent gets to fill it. Um, if if that position hadn't existed at all, and we wanted to create it out of whole cloth, for example, the, there's an RSA that uh, specifies that um, it has to be on the ballot for uh, the school districts to approve. Um, so if we, and, and actually, I, I, it's, it might be even a little more nuanced than that. Like if it's a position not typically associated with an SAU, like uh, um, if we wanted to hire a uh, director of math instruction, for example, that would clearly have to, and it was a new position, the headcount didn't exist before, 
we would have to put it on the ballot on all three districts. And I forget how it works, but I think it's more than half of the districts have to approve it. And of those who approve it, they have to represent at least half of the students in the SAU. I think that's right. Uh, okay, I knew there was a process. I was just thinking about going forward and yep. the, wanting the secondary, secondary curriculum director and all that and just what the position might be, might turn into Correct. be that sort of thing. Okay, Right. thank right. you. Exactly right. Great, thank you. Seeing no further questions, I'll entertain a motion. Ms. Keller, did you want to make a motion to accept the organizational chart? Yes. Great. Do I have a second? I'll second. I'll second. Thank you. Ms. Grund seconds. And uh, any discussion? Seeing no discussion, I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Kuzma? Yes. Mr. Goff here? Yes. Ms. Beam? Beam, yes. Mr. Gronstra? Gronstra, yes. Ms. Facey? Yes. Mr. Chen? Chen, yes. Mr. Coughlin? Yes. Ms. Taylor? Taylor, yes. Mr. Torres? Torres, yes. Ms. Grund? Grund, yes. Ms. Lawrence? Lawrence, yes. Mr. Eckhoff? Eckhoff, yes. Ms. Hinckley? Hinckley, yes. O'Keefe, yes. 14 in favor, none opposed. Uh, the other two or three items on the consent agenda have to do with the treasurer's report. And uh, Mr. Chen had inquired from me after our last uh, customary business meeting with regards to the unassigned fund balance at the SAU level and whether or not there are any avenues or options to reduce some expenses that are COVID related in 2020, 2021. So Mr. Steele, can you potentially address some of those things, items that we could potentially use that for? And the that there was 193,000 left over. I don't know if that's something that uh, I am misreading or not, but if we can just uh, talk to that. And David, if you wanted to um, pipe in as well, maybe offer some, uh, some, some two thoughts there. Sure, so, uh, um, and I'll look to Michelle to either text me or, or say out loud what the unassigned fund balance is for the SAU. But I will say an SAU is different in a couple of ways. First, an SAU is not a district, so there's no direct voting on the budget uh, for the SAU. Um, and an unassigned fund balance doesn't get returned um, to taxpayers. Uh, it stays on the books and can either be used in future years by the board by intentionally underfunding what they charge the, the districts to cover the, uh, the SAU budget for an ensuing year, meaning in rough numbers, we have a $2 million budget, but we've got $200,000 left over from the previous year. So instead of raising $2 million from the three districts, we could raise 1.8 million from the three districts and thus save that $200,000 um, without having to, to raise it from the districts um, again. Or it can be kept on the books for some future use. Or an SAU budget can be overexpended unlike a school district budget, which, which cannot be overexpended. So it works a little differently. But SAU, uh, an SAU budget cannot be used for things that need to be paid for out of a school district, meaning we couldn't buy the Mount Vernon math textbooks from the SAU budget, or we couldn't hire a Sauhegan teacher from the SAU budget because, it's, um, because that would mean that the other two districts would be paying a portion of that teacher or those math textbooks, which would be inappropriate. So it has to be an SAU related expense to be used um, for those purposes. So to the extent that we have COVID related expenditures that are SAU related, which we really don't have very many, if, if any identified at this point, um, maybe we have some PPE we need to purchase for the, the brick school building itself. Um, there aren't uh, things that we've identified beyond what's in the three district budgets. So uh, Michelle, uh, bail me out here and add to or correct anything that I've said um, so far. No, I think you have it um, pretty much uh, completed and, and identified. Um, we do have some smaller items that were identified as PPE for the SAU um, staff, but you know, something that we would anticipate to be able to be absorbed within the existing budget with you know, some reworking of our expenditures. Um, there were also some items that were considered as uh, 
um, additional items for not the HVAC system, but to address, you know, air quality. But there's, you know, that's not necessarily something that needs to be done immediately. Um, the unreserved fund balance, we are in the process of finalizing our records for audit and, and having those um, numbers confirmed. Katie is out of the office this week, so I don't have those numbers for you off the top of my head uh, today, but I can certainly provide an update with that. And, um, we also, if you're looking at expenditures for COVID-related items, there are some um, ability for the board to consider any funds that are set aside. As, as um, Adam pointed out, the board can choose to put funds aside as part of the reserve for the fund balance. That's uh, you know, a little different than at a school district level. But those funds, uh, we have money put aside for building related items. The board could choose to redirect those funds, you know, holding a hearing and talking about, you know, new, um, more um, priority items that you would want to use those funds for and could redirect those funds if the board chose to do that. But as it stands right now, uh, I am not aware of anything that we would be recommending that the board consider for that purpose. Great, that thank you. David. So could, could we decide, or I don't know who could decide this, but could we to move forward and return that money to each of the districts in its appropriate proportion and then if it, when it gets back to the district, in effect, the district can use it for PPE or whatever it wants to. Um, is that, is there any possibility of doing it that way? It seems to me that it was contributed to by the, by the various districts and it could go back to the districts in its proper proportion. And the districts could actually have some use of that funding and it doesn't necessarily have to go or the districts could turn, return it to the taxpayer as well. That's a possibility as well. So the process for um, apportioning the SAU budget is, is pretty clearly defined. It yeah. doesn't work exactly the way you might think. It, it's not as though there's savings in the budget and so that cash goes back to the, the participating districts. What happens is if, let's say there's, the budget is um, underspent by, you know, $1,000, then in the next budget cycle, you simply apportion $1,000 less to the participating districts, and it gets budgeted in the participating districts at a lesser amount. So the, each district is actually paying the, the amount that's budgeted each year, and if there's a savings in the SAU budget, it simply reduces the amount that's requested in the subsequent year. Okay. And so Michelle, just to clarify real fast, then that would create excess capacity with inside each district to leverage those funds for other COVID related type purposes because our SAU bill was lower? Yeah. Well, what it does is if, if you think about the process now, if we had savings in the current year budget, then when we apportion for FY22, we'll simply budget in each of the other districts a lesser amount. So you don't really end up creating savings in, in the school districts other than through the fact that you might be asking the district to budget a smaller amount than previously requested. Okay. David, does that uh, answer your question or your thought, address your thought? It addresses it. I'm not sure that I'm happy with it, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> not the answer you were looking for. I understand. Yeah, yeah right. It's okay though. All right, so uh, I will uh, I will personally make the motion to accept uh, the remaining consent uh, agenda items, specifically the treasurer's report. And I'll entertain someone making a second. I'll second. Great, thank you, Beth. Um, any discussion? We'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Kuzma? Yes. Mr. Goffier? Yes. Ms. Beam? Beam, yes. Mr. Gronstra? Gronster, yes. Ms. Facey? Yeah. Mr. Chen? Chen, yes. Mr. Coughlin? Yes. Ms. Taylor? Taylor, yes. Mr. Torres? Torres, yes. Ms. Grund? Grund, yes. Ms. Lawrence? Lawrence, yes. Mr. Eckhoff? Eckhoff, yes. Ms. Hinckley? 
Hinkley, yes. O'Keefe, yes. 14 in favor, none abstaining. Uh, let's move on into the agenda here. Great. Let's go over to the fiscal uh, 22 budget process with uh, our business administrator, Michelle. Thank you. Um, I'll start by sharing the process that we've implemented with each of the school districts. And that is that um, through a meeting with the, the board chair, the what I call the review committee chair, which is Ways and Means, um, uh, so he can advisory finance committee or the budget committee chair, and um, the moderator, we reviewed sort of debriefed the prior year process and then reviewed a, a schedule and a process for the budget from the point of time that it was presented by the superintendent through the point of time that it's approved by the, the board. And in that, we scheduled the subcommittee meeting dates right up front, um, timelines for individual uh, review committee, full committee uh, meetings and deliberation by the board and then also meetings for the board and the review committee to get together to talk about the budget and address any open questions. It also included a process where after um, the presentation of the budget to the board that we held one meeting that was open to um, both the review committee and the, the full board to talk about the logistics of the budget document and how to find information in the budget file and how it was structured and, and so that people knew where to, to find that information. From that point, we opened up a, a form that allowed people, we'll be opening up a form to allow people to submit questions and we'll have a specified period of time for question submission. And then at the end of that time, typically a, you know, a week to seven days, we would close the question time period and have two more days to finish responding to those questions. At the close of the question period, we'd begin subcommittee reviews. So for the SAU budget, we'd identify the committees or the, a couple dates that we would sit down and go through the budget in, in detail, review the questions that were submitted, the responses that were submitted, and then open up that form again and document any new questions that come through the subcommittee process and document responses to those as well so that everybody could be familiar with both the questions and the responses and there was some record of them. Um, from that point, it would go to the, the board, back to the board for consideration with information from the, the committee members that were participating and then final approval by the board. So at this point, we had identified that whole process in the individual districts working with that smaller group of folks to iron out all the dates and then share the dates with folks that wanted to participate in part of the, the budget process. Here at the SAU level, it would be, you know, um, SAU Chair O'Keefe, um, Beth Kuzma, and Stephanie uh, uh, Grund were identified as the budget committee members. So I would propose to meet with them to identify the dates and then publish that for the board members so that you have a clear process from the point of time that the budget is presented by the superintendent to the approval date by, by the board and, and uh, the question review process and how to get um, access to that information. So we've tentatively, um, I floated some dates for folks and we may be able to schedule something on Monday, it looks like to iron out some dates, but I'm working with folks to nail that initial meeting down. Are there any questions about the process? I don't know if that was clear or it's, we're gonna follow similar to what we're doing with the dis individual school districts. Great, thank you, Michelle. And uh, just a quick uh, point of clarification, the SEU budget process is a little bit different from a timeline standpoint. Can you just talk about when that's going to be presented to the full board for approval? our public hearing and so forth? The initial uh, presentation by the superintendent is October 29th for the budget. And the date of approval, I'll have to, I'm sorry, I don't have that right in front of me. Okay. So I'll include that in the, uh, the list of the dates. That's a November meeting. It's a November SAU meeting though. Is Thank the you. Hearing. Yeah. 
Great. And then one other thing as uh, board chair, I was wondering if it's okay with you, if we do invite uh, one or two members from the public to also serve on that budget committee, I think it'd be a great opportunity for public to have not only a lens into the SEO budget, but I'll say in, in terms of how we vet that. Um, if it's okay with you, I can go ahead and we can make an announcement tonight and send out a quick uh, email to uh, our community inviting members of the public to submit a letter of interest to myself and the superintendent and we can appoint that person at our um, at our budget committee meeting. Hey, Steve, are you asking for people in addition to the like, because usually the Sohegan Finance Committee, the yeah. Amherst Ways and Means Committee and Mon Vernon have a member also reviewing the SAU budget along with us. You're asking yeah, for additional so public. So literally members of the public to, 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 to participate directly into that. Um, way back in the day, um, I believe we actually used to try to do that. Yeah. Um, it was, wasn't always easy to find people, but we would try to, each board would try to get somebody appointed um, from the community that was not part of Ways and Means or a board member on top of the other ones. So even if we could get at least one Amherst resident and at least one Mont Vernon resident, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I just know in the past, uh, the, the, the public has expressed some um, displeasure about the transparency. And you know, I think it's something that uh, is, is, is definitely something we can accomplish and do and, and provide that layer of transparency to, to our communities. Also, right, so, board members have comments about you know, the prior process or things that you would like you know, specifically addressed going forward. Please feel free to reach out to me and, and share those ideas and we'll try to accommodate. Great, thank you, Michelle. And Ms. Taylor, go ahead. I thought there was a policy where anyone from the community that serves on a committee of the board has to be approved by the board. Is there time in the process to have that approval? Well, we can easily go ahead and uh, set up uh, uh, an approval at our next board meeting. Okay. Which is what, September? 15th, I believe. So Mr. Chair, would you like us to put out an advertisement or to solicit volunteers for that and then have that ready for the September 14th board meeting? I think that'd be great. Ms. Taylor, did you have another comment? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Hearing no other further comments about that, let's go to the transportation RFP with Mr. Steele. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so um, we have our um, regular bus transportation is uh, currently in year six of a five-year contract. Um, we extended the, the, the five-year contract an extra year um, for this current school year. And it's time for us to do uh, a request for proposals for bus transportation services. And so uh, we'll be doing that um, this fall. Uh, we intend to have the uh, process completed in time for the budgetary impact of the results of the selection process to be able to be inserted into our uh, three school district budgets, Amherst, Mount Vernon, and Sohegan. There's no SAU bus transportation. Um, and so we'll be going through that process. And I, I wanna speak to what the process will look like so the SAU board is, is well aware. Um, a request for proposals, if you're not f familiar, is, a, is, is legally different than a bid. Uh, people often use the term bid when they sometimes mean request for proposals. And the difference quite simply is if we were buying a thousand sheets of drywall, we would put out a bid and we would just want the lowest price for four by eight sheets of drywall and uh, we'd specify the thickness, but we wouldn't really care whether Home Depot, Lowe's, or the local hardware store uh, won the bid, we just want the lowest price. Um, if any of us wanted to have uh, brain surgery, um, we would not look for the lowest price brain surgeon. We would look for the most qualified person and probably make sure that we could afford to pay them for the brain surgery. Um, so for things that are professional service, like legal services, medical services, architectural services, and bus transportation, we care about the cost but we also care about how the, the, the service is being provided and need to ensure it's being provided at a high level. And so we don't use a bid, we use a, a request for a proposals process 
whereby we will likely choose the lowest price proposal that comes forward, but may not. We might find that uh, a proposal from someone that's a slightly higher price provides a better service and thus justifies um, paying the, uh, the extra cost for that. And so our request for proposals, the RFP document is a legal document that we prepare, that we put out to uh, any uh, and all um, uh, provider who could provide bus transportation services to us. Um, they, there is a very prescriptive process that they must follow. We have a pre-proposal meeting with potential interested parties where we answer their questions with everybody present. So everybody understands the, the, the RFP uh, very well. And then the proposals are due at, a, at a, a fixed moment in time and are sealed until opened um, in a public format where everybody can see the, the, the proposals and they're open and available for public inspection. Uh, once we receive those proposals, we review them. Uh, we can inquire and, and, and ask clarifying questions of those who provided proposals. And then ultimately, uh, we as the administration will be making a recommendation at the SAU board level uh, for an adoption that then will need to be also approved at the individual board level. Um, this is another one of those instances where it makes sense for the SAU to act as if we are one uh, district because how difficult might that be if the Amherst School District picked a different bus transportation provider than the Sohegan School District, where we're expecting kids from both districts to ride the same buses at different points in the, in the day, and in some cases at the exact same time when our Amherst Middle School students ride at the same time as our Sohegan High School students. So it's important that we work in concert, although each district is legally allowed to do whatever they want um, as individual districts. Um, so that's our process. Um, we have a, um, uh, we'll be going through that and starting that off. We are uh, welcoming any board participation in that process if you'd like to participate. Um, it, is a, it is a confidential process, meaning that we can't have a quorum of any individual board participate because we need to ensure that the uh, RFP document is not made public before it's ready um, and that uh, the process is, is kept confidential until it becomes a public uh, opening process, but happy to have board participation. Um, and uh, uh, we'll be coming to the board. I believe our goal is to come in November with a recommendation uh, for the SAU board so that uh, the board can approve that and we can have in December uh, any budgetary impact be included before we go to public hearings in January. So that's an overview of the process um, and be happy to answer any questions. And I see lots of hands raised, so I'd be glad to answer those. Excuse me. Um, what, um, so first, I love to volunteer to be a part of that. Second, and really my question was um, the public opening of the letters or, you know, the um, offers or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my mind is blanking on the name that you called it, but proposals. Proposals, proposals thank you. The, um, the, it, does that happen at the board meeting? Because it's it, that once it's opened, it's then become a public document. Will we all see it ahead of time? Yeah. Yes, you know, the, the opening will happen um, at the SAU office. Um, it's, it's something that I would do and anybody could come. It's open to the whole world. And then the board would see and the public would see all of the proposals. Um, so um, sometimes there are, um, uh, uh, RFP processes where the, the proposals can't all be made public because of some proprietary information, but this is bread and butter bus transportation. It's going to be cost per bus per day, and, you know, it's going to be nothing that I would anticipate would, would not be able to be public. Okay. Mr. Goff here. Uh, I have four quick questions, uh, Adam. They're, they should be quick questions anyway. Number one, are you concerned that Butler Bus Company is not going to come back with a proposal? Uh, and I asked this question as, as part of question number two, are we concerned that we will not get more than one proposal for this? And this all goes back to last year's discussions with Michelle in the fact that when we got Butler Bus Company six years ago, um, they were really one of the few companies that could do it. So are we concerned that we are going to be either losing them or um, have them as the only option? Yeah, so, and I want to be careful. I don't want to, I don't want to speak publicly about um, my um, opinion of vendors at all. Um, that would be uh, improper. Um, but I, 
from what I understand, I fully expect Butler Bus to provide a proposal. And I know of at least two other companies that are very likely to do so as well. Okay. Um, there are two other companies in the area um, that are surrounding school districts use that being uh, first student and STA um, student transportation of America um, that are very active in the state. And I would fully expect them to participate as well. But I, again, I don't know that for sure. Cause I'm not in any conversation. Sure. I guess, yeah, I just want to make sure that we weren't in, there was nothing immediately on the horizon we had to be concerned about. Um, so I assume that we are sending the RF, RFP out as a district wide proposal, SEU 39 and not as individual districts, correct? That's correct. Okay. And then my last question, it's a stupid one that I'm sick of asking, but um, for unveiling the proposals, will Zoom count as an option for viewing this? Because I assume that you can't fit 100 interested people in the SAU office. Yeah, well, that's a great thought. We'll do it via Zoom. Yeah. Okay. I'll be happy to get five interested people besides the bidders. But that, I'm that's... sure you would, but I just, yeah. we have to ask this question with everything in life now. So, indeed. Thank you. Mr. Coughlin. So, the, the last two bus contracts, which goes back at least 11 years and probably further, we jointly bid with Milford under the theory that more volume equals lower cost. Are we doing that again or is, are we going our own way this time? Yeah, uh, great question. So uh, we've had conversations with uh, Milford and uh, what's the other district that, um, um, that they're, what's right behind Milford, that small uh, district? Well, Mine Road? No. Mason? Uh, is it Mason? Mason. Brooklyn. Yeah, I think it's Mason. They use our same buses as well. So we're in talks with them about doing it as a joint effort as well. And we've also had preliminary conversations with other bordering school districts that have expiring bus contracts next year, like, like we do, about doing some sort of joint initiative. And uh, uh, not a follow-up, but a second question. Um, is the special ed contract at the, going out at the same time? Are you going to try and get a single vendor for both or what's the plan? No, so, uh, you might remember that we uh, had some difficulty with uh, not our provider, but with um, our, some contractual issues that we resolved um, two years ago. And uh, that contract was part of that was an extension of that contract. So I, and, and I, it's not on the tip of my tongue, but I believe we have at least two or three more years left on that special education bus transportation contract. I believe it expires 2023. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Facey. I'm sorry, Steve asked my question. The awesome. Mr. Torres. Quick question for Adam. The criteria listed on the RFPs are any prerequisites. How are those determined? Is that based on precedent or is there a specific guideline that you're following or we are following as a district? In terms of uh, in qualifications, terms of, in, in terms of being the ability to apply uh, to even put in a bid or RFP, excuse yeah. me. So in other words, if, if Torres Transportation Services provides a proposal, how will we validate that Torres Transportation is a, is a bona fide provider, correct? Right, right. I may start one up tonight. I, I was thinking you might. Um, so uh, um, that will be part of the process uh, where we require, we typically require a, a, um, a bid um, or a proposal bond that they need to provide as part of their proposal. And okay. what that does is uh, ensures their financial viability to provide this because a third party examines their finances and um, validates their proposal by saying that they're, uh, and they're fiscally um, right. obligated should they not be able to provide the services they say they're going to provide. Uh, we have financial remuneration that we would get as a result of that. So that will be part of the process. Okay. All right. Thank you. Ms. Grant. Um, Adam, if you need someone from Sohegan School Board, I'll volunteer to look at it. That'd be great. Awesome. So, uh, Mr. Steele, if it's okay with you, let's see if we can capture three volunteers, one from each district right now. So, uh, Ms. Grund, I'm assuming that you are the volunteer for Sohegan. Anyone else from Sohegan want to participate in that? I would not mind uh, volunteering. Great. So Stephanie and George, you guys want to fight it out? Rock, no, paper, scissors? It, yeah. no, Stephanie, it doesn't matter, it. George. You can, you, George, ahead, if you Stephanie. want it. No, it's fine. I, I, I thought he was looking for more, but you've already 
step forward. So you drew the short straw. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Stephanie from uh, from Sohegan. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, let's uh, Amherst. I'd love to do it. All right, Beth. Uh, Beth from Amherst and Mont Vernon. I'll do it. Great, Ms. Hankley. Thank you. We have our three uh, appointments. Appreciate that, guys. Awesome. All right, so let's uh, move on into our agenda here. Screen management, guys. Bear with me just a moment. <laughs> Annual assessment data with uh, our assistant superintendent, Christine Vanderall. Yeah, yes, and I'll, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll tee that off quickly for her, mm -hmm. not that she needs any introduction, but <laughs> it's our hope, Mr. Chair, this is a new thing, and we're hoping to do this on an annual basis in August, where we have a major presentation of all of our annual assessments that we have in our SAU. So um, this, again, is the first time we're doing this, but we hope this is a chance to aggregate all of the various presentations we have during the course of the year about NWEA, SAT, all of that sort of sort of thing. So we trust that board members have had a chance to review the information that was in the packet and I'll turn it over to our esteemed assistant superintendent, the Christine Landwell. Thank you. Um, so I'll go fairly quickly through this presentation. Um, uh, we have lots of data we wanted to share with you and really give you an overview or a, a picture um, of where our districts are. So I have information from NWEA, that's our insights report that we get each year. That report um, goes from one year to the next. Um, we do fall to fall because that's our, um, the um, test that most of our students participate in in the, in the fall. Um, so that's fall 2018 to fall 2019. We have PSAT results from the fall, but we do not have our SAT from the spring. Students were unable to take SAT since we had moved to remote learning and they'll be taking it in September. Um, we have attendance rates, graduation rates, and our post high school reporting. We normally would also have our New Hampshire SAS results. Um, we do not, uh, again, have those results because um, New Hampshire SAS um, was not administered this spring also due to remote learning. So our NWEA results, I'll just share um, a few important highlights. This is a great overview slide. Our achievement levels are well above um, the uh, average level. We're in the 70th percentile and our growth is right where it should be. It's um, at the 40, uh, 49th percentile, so it's um, typical growth. So we'd love to have slightly stronger than, than typical growth, but it is still strong growth. Um, so right around that, that 50th percentile. Um, and this is just showing um, our growth over uh, three years. And again, that growth varies from year to year. Um, this is a really interesting slide and we'd like to look kind of um, deeply at this. So if you take our students and um, really, really look at each of our quartiles, we have 45% of our students in the top quartile. So nationally, you know, that um, where only that top 25% of your students, um, we have actually 45% of our students in that range. Um, and then looking at that bottom quartile, we only have um, the district overall 6% of our students in that range. And what's also nice is our um, math and reading is fairly similar. So we're not too far off um, with uh, our, our students, you know, many more than typical performing in that top quartile and um, a lot fewer than typical in that bottom quartile. So um, very strong results here. Um, and then uh, this just shows a breakdown by school. Um, and the only reason these are orange is because this median growth percentile is just uh, slightly above that um, 50th percentile. But this is just showing you status, which is achievement compared to growth for each of our schools for each of the content areas. And then this is actually taking our NWEA scores and looking at how students might perform on a norm referenced uh, test, uh, sorry, a criterion reference test. So NWEA is a norm reference test. Um, it's how students are doing compared to peers where criterion referenced is how students are doing compared to a benchmark or a criteria. 
so if you take our NWEA results and, and compare them to um, what that, that benchmark might be, that end of say fourth grade or end of fifth grade expectation, um, you can see that uh, you know, different grade levels are um, farther above and more students are um, meeting that benchmark where there are other grade levels that you know, we need to look a little bit more deeply at, um, especially um, in that fifth and sixth grade range, which you're gonna see throughout um, this presentation. So in here, um, this is status. So again, this is achievement and you can see some little dips in some places with our reading, but with our math, um, we have a, a deeper dip here, which is something that we're concerned about. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So you can see it both in the achievement as well as the growth in math here. And then we always like to look at how boys and girls compare and really very similar both in achievement levels and in growth levels. So no significant difference there. Um, and then also subject and grade span. Um, so that was NWEA. So that's a pretty deep um, look at our NWEA results from one year to the next. Um, and that insights report, students have to finish fall testing and then we're able to order that. So we don't get that typically till the winter and we'd like to bring all of these reports together to be able to give you a pretty deep dive. Um, at the end of this presentation, I also included links if you wanna look more deeply at each of our testing periods from last year, looking at both the fall and our winter testing and we did not do spring testing for NWEA last year. And then our PSAT results from last year. And again, this was our juniors um, that took this um, in the fall. Um, and typically they take PSAT in the fall and then take SAT in the spring. Um, what's nice about that is we can really look at the growth that students have made from PSAT to SAT. So I um, often don't um, present PSAT results in isolation. Um, it's also, it's often helpful to see those SAT results. So our PSAT results, you can um, see how students are doing in meeting that college and career ready benchmark. And I want to remind you that that benchmark is, an, is really an end of high school benchmark. It is truly whether students are ready to enter a college level course. Um, so in the fall of uh, their junior year, 86% of our students were um, showing readiness to enter a college level course in English. And 55% of our students were ready to enter a college level course in math in the uh, fall of, of junior Junior year. So very strong. Um, and uh, the mathematics um, benchmark is a higher benchmark. So in math, students would need to have a scaled score of 510 in order to reach that college and career ready benchmark <laughs> where the evidence-based reading and writing is only a 460. So that is another reason typically why we have less students meeting that mathematics benchmark. And compared to our state results, we're significantly above the state level. And in looking at how our students compared, um, I don't always compare one cohort to the next. You know, I'd prefer to compare the PSAT to SAT, but since we don't have that SAT data, in looking at um, our results from fall of 2018 to fall of 2019, now it is a different cohort of students, um, but we had 79% of our students um, in English being able to meet that benchmark where this fall we had 86% of our students. And then you can also see that compared to um, our, the, compared to the state. And in math, in fall of 2018, 50% of our students met the benchmark where this past fall it was 55% of students meeting the benchmark. We also like to take a look at our attendance rates um, to really uh, make sure if the, uh, that we have high attendance rates and really looking at that student engagement. Um, so this is average daily attendance by school. Um, and we looked both at 2018-19 school year and 19-20 20, and school year. 19-20 school year um, certainly was impacted slightly by our, our disrupted instruction. And it's actually a little bit higher than it was the previous year, um, but it is, you know, uh, still above the state average, which you can see here is 94.6% in the 18-19 school year. Um, we don't have the state results yet for 19-20 school year. And then our graduation rate, I have both the 18-19 and 19-20, um, just so you can uh, kind of compare. It's, it's always hard if it's just that one data point to see. So I wanted to be able to share additional data points with you. Um, and also in many cases, the 1920 results, we don't have state information yet. So um, this 
uh, most recent um, spring, our, our graduation from Sohegan, 98% of seniors graduated this June, and all graduates were four-year students. We didn't have any five-year students in this cohort. Um, very low dropout rate. Um, and often the year before we had a 0% drop off the dropout rate. Um, and again, state level data not available yet, but we're significantly above the um, state target or, or even state average um, in looking you know, at the, the 1819 data. And another um, set of information that we're tracking and really interesting, we're just starting to dig into this and, and be able to get more and more data is post high school reporting. So we're actually able to work with the National Student Clearinghouse, um, their student tracker to be able to um, track the, how our students are doing after high school. So first of all, I wanted to be very clear, this data is not <laughs> fully reported yet. Um, so this is what has come in so far. So I know it looks like we fell off a cliff there, um, but um, you know, wanted to share with you that uh, you know, we're, well, we're above that national average here at 77% of our students enrolled in college in the fall immediately after high school. Um, and you can see that for multiple years. Um, the other important thing we track is um, that freshman to sophomore persistence rate. Um, and you can see we hover around the national average for our persistence rate. And this is a really interesting um, slide. This actually shows, and I grabbed the class of 2012 because, because it was the oldest data we had. Um, so it gives us the you know, most complete picture for our students. So you can see um, the green is, is students that just um, entered. Um, and then the purple now um, uh, over, I, I think it's uh, uh, the high 90s, like 98 or 99 percent of colleges report. So the, um, some of this purple might be that it, a student could have attended a college that that didn't report. Um, but for the most part, this was, um, you know, they they weren't in the database for some reason, um, either the college wasn't reporting or um, they did not enter. Uh, post-secondary program. But you can see that, um, you know, our persist the students who persisted here and then also the students who graduated and what that looks like. So you can really look at that, you know, a three-year, a four-year, a five-year, a six-year um, graduation and, and how that changes as students move out through. Um, and also even students who returned after dropping out. Um, so really interesting and um, certainly, you know, strong data here. We, we don't have this information compared nationally, though, and this is a, a new tool to us that we're really still digging into, but these are strong results. Um, so overall, our summary and recommendations, um, NIWA results showing high achievement and average growth. Um, our top quartile of students, they are growing less than all other quartiles. So that is an important thing to look at that has been um, consistent and something we've been tracking over the past few years. Um, we've only been able to start tracking this as we've um, been able to get that deeper NWEA insights report. And um, you know, this is the third year of that consistent data. And one thing that we did this year during our reopening professional development, which has been going on since Monday, um, it's been busy, but really exciting work. We've really been able to um, focus deeply with our teachers on um, looking at formative assessments and how we assess students in the moment all the time um, and, and do it in a, a way that really allows us to target supports for students that might need it, but also to be able to work at, at um, providing more enrichment to our students that are ready to move on. Um, and this year, what is exciting, you know, we've had to make a lot of structural changes um, to welcome students back. And in doing so, we've actually built in more flexible structures to spur students and more opportunities to provide that enrichment um, and even that, that intervention. So um, uh, excited to um, hopefully capitalize on, on some of those more flexible structures to provide more support uh, to students and, and more enrichment to students. We're also noticing with NWEA a little achievement and growth dip in math. And this is starting in grade three and continuing through grade five. Um, and we're also seeing a little dip in grade five. And again, that dip um, is representative of instruction from the previous year. So there are a few things. So in ELA, our fourth grade um, was using different materials than 
our kindergarten through third grade. And this year, um, we had actually decided last year, and we have been working with teachers, we've decided to use the same materials that we use in, in kindergarten through third grade with fourth grade. So we actually just did training today with our fourth grade ELA teachers, um, and um, even deeper training really with K through four in um, reading and in writing. So we're excited to be able to make that little tweak and change and hope that it has an impact on our scores in fourth grade for ELA. Uh, for math, our um, math program is um, an older program. <laughs> it was adopted when I first <laughs> arrived here. So um, we have been looking to replace our math program. And the challenge was really finding a high quality program that um, fit the way we teach math. And there are a lot more options um, available now for math programs. And we were really excited in being in the possibility of piloting um, for this school year. But unfortunately, because of our disruption and because of so many changes, we didn't think it was fair to try to pilot a a program. Um, but we're still looking at, at how we might be able to utilize um, some different math materials to be able to bring a new program in. So we were, we're looking at some creative ways and we want to see how this school year unfolds to see what we can do because we do feel like we need um, to purchase new math material, materials that are more deeply aligned to standards than the, the current materials we have. We think that's what is causing that dip um, after first grade. And then our PSAT results, um, you know, they're certainly above the state average and um, our 2019 results are showing higher achievement levels than our 2018 results. But I'm really curious um, to see what our 2020 SAT results show for our seniors and be able to compare that. Um, and especially with the disruption, it will be interesting um, to see the growth that our, that our students have made, um, you know, from that fall to uh, this fall. And, um, oh, sorry, um, attendance, attendance rates are pretty consistent across our buildings, which is an important piece. There's not one building that we see that there's an attendance issue that's um, different, um, you know, a dip or a decline or a, a, a a, a much lower number in one of our buildings. Um, and our attendance rates are higher than the state average. Um, what I'm excited about too is moving to power school. There's gonna be some new reporting um, and uh, wanna be able to dig into a little bit of that and see if there's any other ways that we can really look at that attendance data. Um, graduation rates above the state average and state target. So really continue to look at that. One important piece is that dropout rate. Um, we really wanna to continue to make sure that we have those individual plans for any student that might be at risk for dropping out to be able to support them, whether if it, it might be an independent study or an extended learning opportunity that student needs to really target support to ensure that they stay with us and are able to graduate. Um, and then with our post high school reporting, a brand new tool, so really continue to really dig into that and explore ways to maybe even get additional feedback um, to further understand what um, that the um, that student tracker is, is showing us um, and you know see if there are any tweaks or changes we could be making at the high school level to really ensure that our students um, are able to persist through college and graduate. And the last slide is just um, more detailed reports for anyone who might need them. I want to dig in a little bit deeper. So I don't know if there's any questions. Thank you, Christine. Uh, we're gonna start off with uh, Tom Goff here. Uh, I have a couple, I'll ask my first one and then I can uh, see the floor to other people that have questions as well. But um, my first part is a statement. I think that looking at those growth numbers and then mm -hmm. uh, it's, to me, I, 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 it's not meant to sound insensitive. So it's, mm -hmm. please don't take it as it comes out that way. But I think we need to do everything we can to keep the schools open this mm -hmm. year because the fact that we have these numbers that are dipping in third through fifth grade and mm -hmm. if we're going to take kids out of classrooms and have homeschooling and have remote learning, which we know is not effective as in person, no matter what we change from last spring, which was obviously done on the fly and done, done as well as could be to what we have this year, the system has to be, has to be different because these kids are already mm -hmm. losing a quarter of a school year to potentially lose more is um, concerning, especially when we don't know when this is really going to end. My question mm -hmm. is, you mentioned the new math program you were going to pilot new materials this year and you said it wasn't fair to do that can I ask mm -hmm. what went into that decision in terms of what was fair um, you mm -hmm. know who it was fair for and just get some more information on that 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, teachers are really critical in being able to um, pilot materials and to um, really fully dive into them, be able to utilize them, um, and really give feedback as to what materials worked best for them, which they felt was the highest quality material, which were user friendly, um, and be able to share uh, with student experience. And our concern with uh, a disrupted year and with our teachers juggling and changing so much, we've made a lot of adjustments and changes um, to accommodate for both that in-person and remote environment. We were worried about trying to pilot math materials on top um, of all of those, those changes already. So our teachers really, as um, Adam mentioned before, you know, teachers are feeling overwhelmed this year. They're a little nervous about returning. Um, they know that, that um, we've changed a lot of structures for them. We've made a lot of adjustments even to our curriculum to make sure that we can match um, what's happening in both a remote and in-person environment so students can move seamlessly. So the concern was adding one more thing um, and, and asking teachers to pilot on top. So we felt the, the best thing to do would be to kick off the school year, see how the year is going, um, to, and really get feedback from teachers to see whether it's feasible or not. You don't have to start a pilot in September. You don't need to pilot materials for a full school year. Um, and it might be that it, it um, might make sense if things are going well. Um, maybe we do bring teachers in for professional development, support a pilot, and we pilot for a few few months um, to be able to make a decision or if we really feel like we have to, um, you know, purchase those new materials, um, you know, is there a way to create some sort of experience for both students and teachers in those materials more deeply without um, uh, maybe piloting as uh, for as long as we normally would. So, so some sort of experience is to make sure that we're not purchasing a program that's not going to be effective for our students and not going to work well for our teachers. Uh, and just as a follow-up, you mentioned, uh, I know last year there was a lot of work done to the science curriculum. Do we have the results of that from the first uh, first year of, of those results yet? I know that being an interrupted school year. Yeah, so we do not use NWEA in science, um, and we never have. So we don't have standardized assessments for science. We were using our performance assessments. So a lot of our labs, um, you know, teachers would, would score those and um, uh, really even starting in fourth grade, we score against standards. Um, so we, with it being a disrupted year, um, you know, in November, we made some adjustments and changes to the way we score students. So uh, I, I didn't pull any of that data. Thank you. Ms. Keller. Thank you, Christine. Um, I was noticing that you used the PSAT scores I thought that the SAT scores were used for New Hampshire to judge college readiness and the PSAT and the SAT are on different scales. Is yes, that so, um, the PSAT does have a slightly different benchmark um, than the SAT does. It's still a college and career readiness benchmark for on track for college and career readiness. Um, SAT is the state assessment, but because students didn't take that state assessment, I wasn't able to report out on that. Well, my, my bigger question is, I remember um, back when we did SAU 39 goals, and I thought one of those goals would be a, to be a top five in New Hampshire, if I remember that correctly. And what is that based on, that ranking? So I know we've talked about um, being able to provide comparative district data, but since we didn't have a state assessment, I don't have any comparative district data. So if um, not all districts have all of their students take the PSAT at the same time, we do so that we're able to get those results um, from you know, our whole class um, as a class. But that is not something that is consistently necessarily done across the state and in other high schools. So I don't have comparative district data to be able to share with you um, our PSAT results compared to other districts. I only have that for our state assessment for SAT. Yes, I, I do realize that this year, obviously the SAT couldn't be performed in the spring, but US News and World Report also uses the SAT and AP scores as uh, a way to rank our high school um, I just wanted to point that out, that how, is New, how will New Hampshire be ranking schools this year? Um, uh, well, 
um, the SAT is being administered at the end of September to our seniors. Okay, thank you. Ms. Kuzma. So, um, looking at the fourth, fifth, sixth grade dip, mm -hmm. um, we, at least in Amherst, we've acknowledged and I mm -hmm. dealt with that before um, for a couple of years at this point. Um, I know, especially for the fifth grade, a lot of work had been done around the fourth grade curriculum. Um, Mid-year at one point, this was probably mm -hmm. years ago It was now? fifth grade. Yeah, I think it was yeah. probably about three years ago. It was fifth grade. And yeah. we, what's okay. interesting is if you look at the sixth grade results, you see it start to tick up. Um, in sixth grade, which is indicative of fifth grade. So I think the changes we made in fifth grade, like three, I think this was three, three and a half years ago, maybe you, you I think you remember the discussion <laughs> we had. Um, so the fifth grade changes to math actually had a, um, what I think was an impact. It's starting to bring that trend back up. What's happening is really happening actually starting a little bit in second grade. Um, and then also in third grade, then really after fourth grade is when we're really seeing that dip. So there's some cumulative effect that's happening. Um, and I actually, I had a um, pretty deep and interesting conversation with one of our um, professional development providers. A lot of our teachers took training in um, uh, something called OGAP, which is under, it's an ongoing assessment project and understanding um, student developmental levels in mathematics. And um, what uh, the PD provider shared with me is that often when students don't develop a deep enough number sense, once they hit that second and third grade, um, they kind of fall off because, you know, they were still using their fingers or they, they, they hadn't really developed that deep understanding of number. And then when they try to do more complex things, that's where, where it falls off. So what's challenging is um, to really pinpoint exactly where the problem is. It looks like, you know, from that chart, it looks like the problem's in fourth grade, but I don't think it is <laughs> because we start to trail off yeah, it, it's, it's happening earlier. And it could even be more of a cumulative effect that um, could even be something in kindergarten or first grade, which is why I am, you know, I, I think we need to re-examine the materials we're using in math um, to more tightly align to standards to really be able to um, make some wholesale changes in that K to four range. Okay. Um, and then, I don't know if I really want to say, you know, part, you know, we had talked about fifth grade, part of the issue with that particular fall fifth grade test for last year was the fourth grade teachers ran out of time um, to teach certain areas of the curriculum. You know, we've, we are, we've already talked about that in our district, um, but at the same time, this is, you know, so it's kind of you know, part of the issue on that side is they mm -hmm. ran out of time, but also this is an ongoing issue. So it's not like that's, it's an anomaly. <laughs> so, but it's, you know, yeah. And that was with New Hampshire SAS specifically. Um, they didn't get to their geometry unit when they did the state assessment. So kids didn't do well on the geometry section, um, which happens sometimes and it, it does impact scores. Um, with this, it's really looking at, you know, because it's a, the, it's a fall NEWA result, you're really looking at the entire year before, so they should have been able to get to all of those units. Okay. Great, thank you. Ms. Facey. Thank you, yeah, math again. So um, I know that math has been a tough nut for us to crack. Um, mm -hmm long time and I am wondering a few things um, first of all are we when when you're reporting out by grade those are averages right um, across that grade so say there are three or four different um, teachers in a particular grade what you're reporting out are averages um, and let me or just go back rather um, so it is, so if we were looking at, um, it's the, so what, what NEWA reports is the um, median
status percentile. So it um, it is it's a median, but uh, you know it pretty close. It, it it often ends up being pretty close to the average. Um, so it is that that middle point that they are using. They do use the median with the the, the that graph specifically. First, wondering, I, I'm glad to hear that we're taking a look at, um, at looking at some new materials. I'm wondering if we also need to look at other variables that may be affecting this. Are there other things that we can do? Have we considered, um, and I know we're not alone in the state with this, but are there other districts that maybe are doing some things differently that we would want to take a look at beside just um, the materials? So I guess that's part one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then do we have some expertise in-house when we look at, and I know that teachers' um, classes have different cohorts of students, but are there um, teachers in our district who consistently have um, high-performing students in terms of growth? And, you know, they're essentially using the same materials. So do we have that in-house expertise that we can use to, um, to help train other teachers with classes that maybe haven't had as much um, success in terms of growth? Um, achievement growth being mm -hmm. more um, more important. Mm -hmm. Um, well, one thing that we've done, we've been really looking deeply at professional development in math and, um, you know, often our elementary teachers, you know, they're, they're not content experts. They get into teaching because they love kids and they want to be with kids and they often develop an expertise in one subject area or another. We have some elementary teachers who have a deep passion for math, others for science. Um, so th that certainly um, ranges, but, uh, you know, for the most part, um, teachers latch onto that, that literacy piece more than anything um, as far as their area of expertise or their love or their passion at the elementary level. So we've been working really hard to continue to deeply train our teachers in math um, so that our elementary teachers are feeling really comfortable and confident with math. So we've really approached um, math really looking at that professional development lens. Um, I, I think one of the challenges, um, I, I never want people to think that a, a, new, a new math textbook is going to solve all the problems, but um, what it does provide is that common resource and that anchor point for teachers so that instead of spending time, um, like with our current resource, if it, it's not 100% aligned to standards, so we're constantly making little adjustments to it. So we end up spending our time um, working on, hey, let's change this assessment or let's adjust this or let's make this little curriculum change. So there's a lot of work we're doing there where if you flip that and you say here, the, these materials are exactly what you need, they're tightly aligned to standard, um, then the professional development we we time we have with teachers can really be spent in those deep conversations in looking at, um, uh, you know, how did students perform on this assessment? Was there a teacher who had all their students, um, you know, perform at a very high level? What, what did you teach or how did you teach it? So it's being able to have those deep professional conversations and really some of those bright spots like you're speaking to Amy, um, for them to kind of be uncovered through that deep professional discussion around um, math practice um, it is really the direction we'd like to go. And that resource is not meant to solve all their problems, but it's meant to be that anchor point for us to be able to continue that deep professional development and our examination of how we're teaching math. Yeah, I think that's where I was, um, you know, certainly the, the resource has to be um, as best as it can be, but I think mm -hmm. the um, execution also mm -hmm. is really important. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Crump. So Amy kind of hit on some of the things mm -hmm. I was interested in as well. Um, but I do have a couple other questions. Uh, looking at the map growth, when you look at how is growth by grade and subject, um, and you see the median growth percentile of each grade compared to national average, and you see the ninth mm -hmm. grade dip down as well. Is that a trend? Is that typical of ninth grade because it's just how we teach things? 
or is there something with that class we need to watch or so that's indicative of eighth grade instruction so um you know when you're looking at these grades because it's a fall assessment it's actually mm -hmm. showing the growth that they made from the previous fall to that fall. Um, so our ninth grade students, you know, you, you actually see there's a huge amount of growth from ninth grade to 10th grade. Uh -huh. um, so that's actually indicative of ninth grade. We've had really, if you look um, just at the Sauhegan results, um, they're really, really high um, for our, our 10th grade and looking at that growth of that ninth grade year. Um, and they've consistently been high. Um, so, you know, the eighth grade piece, um, you know, I haven't been able to figure out what that little dip is. I've seen it in some years. Um, I, from what I recall, it's not cons not necessarily consistent. Um, it has been, uh, you know, a little bit of a dip some years. Um, and I can't quite figure out um, what that might be uh, with that. But, it, you know, it's something certainly to, to keep tracking. Um, and it's also... It, it, what's challenging is that, you know, you see that they're, they, they get in this hole and then you're, you're spent all this time digging out. And then, so that's, uh, you know, a little dip, but because they recover so much from it, I'm, I'm just not sure what, what's happening mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Cause I, I think they see that and I'm like, Ooh, what's going to happen yeah. next year? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, is it a cohort thing or is it typical ninth grade? That's what I'm, yeah. So it'd be I interesting if we can look into it. Yeah, I do sometimes see a little dip there, but that is a more of a dip than I have seen in previous years. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to keep our eye on that one. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the PSAT results, again, it's another, it's another almost a cohort question. Mm -hmm. it, is this a strong class that took the PSAT that typically scores high on things, or is this pretty typical? Like, what's the, tr what's the trend look like for PSAT? That's a good question. I know... Um, Karen might be able to answer that better than I can. Mm. Um, you know, you have to go all the way back to their eighth grade year because they don't have that standardized assessment. That's a, a, a criterion reference assessment um, as freshmen and sophomores. So it's a little bit harder to track them through. Um, so I didn't go back to that eighth grade data. I certainly, you know, when we get our SAT results and I dig in, I certainly can look at that, look um, and, and go back to see what some of those previous results were. Yeah, and SAT will be interesting because the kids who mm -hmm. were supposed to take it in the spring are now how many months mm -hmm. out from Yep. learning and all teaching and all that. So yeah, that will be interesting. Um, yeah. One, uh, oh, two, two other questions. One, one will be quick. Um, the first one though, post high school reporting, mm -hmm. how does it consider kids who either enter the military, uh, enter a trade, enter community college? Is this only measuring four-year colleges? What is it actually it, measuring? It does measure two-year and four-year colleges, but I do okay. not believe it measures a, like a, a trade school. So I don't think that they're connected um, yeah. to that. And certainly a, a student that might go straight into a career, it's not tracking them. Um, if they end up going back into college, it will grab them and it will show them oh, um, okay. in there. Yep. So they don't have to be... Um, so, you know, back in that presentation, they, um, there was that, it was a blue, um, so they, um, or, you know, green will sometimes pop up in places. So there was even um, one year out, a little bit of green popped up, meaning that they were new yeah. to college. Um, and then there's also even um, a returned after a stop out. So a student may have left after their freshman year and then stopped for a year and then came back. Okay. So, you know, they, um, do report all of that. It's really interesting, but again, without the context of, of that or seeing multiple years and this data is still new to us. Yeah, because so I was making sure that, yeah, because we have kids who, you know, four-year colleges aren't right for everybody. So the question mm -hmm. is, what is this measure as? So I was curious what mm -hmm. data is all accumulated in there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then one last thing, um, this year, because we have some kids learning remote and we have mm -hmm. some kids learning in person, when we go, if we have assessments made this year, whether it's NIWA mm -hmm. or what we are able to do, are we able to separate out what kids were taught remotely versus in person and see if there's an issue with a teaching modality or we know, yeah, so we make sure we address mm -hmm. all concerns. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, with NWEA, which one of the challenges at the high school level, kids start to, to sealing out of NWEA. So mm -hmm. we typically only would give it in the fall of um, ninth grade and then the fall of 10th grade. So certainly um, when we look at this a year from now and we administer NWEA in 10th grade, we can look back um, for ninth grade. We should be able to disaggregate. We might have to do some manual <laughs> disaggregating. Mm -hmm. And again, students okay. might be choosing um, in different segments, you know, different fun. options. So that might be a little bit of a challenge to track, um, it, you know, um, but if we have a remote teacher and, and um, you know, we can pull um, to look at the, the by teacher too, to be able to see, um, but you know, with 200 students, you can do an export and then do a, a manual merge and kind of look at the data that way. It's a little clunkier to do, um, but we certainly can do that. Yeah, so just make sure no kids get left behind and, mm -hmm get lost because they chose a certain modality yeah. is my concern. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I'm done. No, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Peter. Thanks, Steve. Um, just questioning. I have a question and then a comment. And the question is, if we were to change out the math program from K through 12, what would the cost be uh, for the textbooks and all everything, uh, soup to nuts? And my comment would be, I would hope that that would not be an impediment to making that change because mm -hmm. obviously the results are showing that, you know, that we have a, a, a swoon, a challenge, whatever you, how you want mm -hmm. to describe it. And even though we're spending a lot of money on non-educational things this year, because we have to, I would hope that you and your team would come to us at the board and tell us that you think you need to make mm -hmm. the change. And, given the cost, we'd figure out a way to get the money to, to mm -hmm. fix it. Because it, to me, it doesn't make any sense to keep doing what we're doing if we're gonna mm -hmm. get the same results. So I put it in the budget, <laughs> so you actually will see it. <laughs> um, we're looking actually to make that change in kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, most, pro most math programs, they have a K-5 program, a 6-8 program, and then a 9-12 program. We're actually really happy with the, the math books we have at the high school. Um, they are one of the highest rated as far as alignment to standards for an integrated math program of any program we have. We've gotten great feedback from our teachers on that resource, and I wouldn't want to make any changes at the high school. Um, and really Really our, our NWEA results from ninth grade to 10th grade show huge growth for our students. So I think we're in good shape at the high school. Um, in sixth or eighth grade, you see that um, that pretty strong upward trend. Um, and you also want to remember that our middle school teachers, for the most part, are content experts um, in mathematics. Now we have a lot of you know K-8 certified teachers also teaching at the middle school, um, but they've really developed a deep expertise for math. They've been teaching it for a while, even if they didn't um, enter teaching as a, a math teacher only. Um, so I think that content expertise matters too. Um, so we certainly would look to refresh their materials as well. Um, but I thought it made sense for us to look K-5 because that's where our critical issue is and then chunk out and then look after, you know, a year or two after for six through eight. Um, and it also spreads those expenses out. And, um, you know, in the past textbook purchases were, um, extremely expensive. They were these big hardcover books um, and they're just, uh, they're not as expensive anymore. Um, for the most part, a lot of the books, especially at the elementary level, um, are just workbooks. So that would be an ongoing expense and we swap out our current workbook cost with the new workbooks. It's just a matter of buying the teacher materials. Um, so all of that will be in the budget and I'll be able to speak to that for each of the districts when we present the budget. All right, guys, uh, we are over 30 minutes on this particular topic. So let's uh, quickly go to Amy Facey for one final question and then to Laura. Really quick. Um, so I, people have varying views on the SAT, but like it or not, it's um, a really important admissions criteria for mm -hmm. uh, many schools. So. I'm wondering, um, I think, you know, we're working really hard to have our curriculum aligned with standards and that's the SAT mm -hmm. is as well. Um, but some of it is test taking. Um, mm -hmm. And I know we've had a, um, a prep course available at the high school mm -hmm. that I think is was, um, there was a charge for that. Mm -hmm. Is there any way we can look to have something for all students to be able to have that available to them? Um, I also know there's 
Um, the PSATs are aligned with Khan Academy and there's a lot of great mm -hmm. stuff, but a lot of students may not access that. Um, mm -hmm. Can we work somehow um, to provide something that has more structure for students? Because I think most students respond better if there's mm -hmm. structure instead of, hey, sign on to Khan, Khan Academy, so. Yeah, yeah, um, and I had looked um, to budget for that. Um, and, you know, one of the challenges was we're already running a program. So it's really looking at, um, and it's a, a program that has to be, you know, paid for by parents, but really looking at expanding out that program. Um, so that is something on my list and I'll make sure I budget for that for this year. Great. Laura Taylor. Um, I would like to continue this conversation at the Sohegan School Board, perhaps. I know last year you presented it to the school board and we had a very nice discussion. And, um, you know, a lot of the SAT issues are the Sohegan issues. Was there something not nice about tonight's conversation? Oh, it was fine. It's just, you know, you're limiting our conversation in order to, because you have a lot of things to discuss, which is perfectly understandable. We're more than happy to re-engage everyone uh, this conversation during our next meeting, if that's... <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> no, thank you, Christine. It was a nice presentation. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Seeing uh, no other comments for uh, this particular item. Thank you, Christine, for your time and always uh, your awesome effort. Uh, let's move on to board goals. So uh, Mr. Vice Chair Coughlin mentioned after our last uh, meeting back in, I think it was June, um, that uh, the SAU board still has yet to adopt board goals for a superintendent. And a lot of that had to happen with, number one, the uh, change in election, uh, the COVID crisis that actually dramatically changed the way we deliver educational services to our community. And uh, you know, tonight, we're just going to open up the floor for a quick discussion in terms of what we want to do about uh, the board goals for the remaining uh, portion of this particular school calendar year. Um, back in our May meeting, uh, I'm sorry, our March meeting, uh, Former Chair Facey had mentioned that uh, she had set up a Google Doc uh, soliciting comments for uh, ideas for goals for all of our uh, board members to submit to our superintendent. Ms. Facey, I hate to put you on the spot. I, Mr. Coughlin and I couldn't find that anywhere, uh, let alone a Trello board that was set up. And uh, we also had uh, the superintendent's office do uh, some, some pretty deep digging into the files there to, to look to see if any ideas or strategies were even submitted. Okay. Um, but I can certainly reshare it. That'd be great. Okay. But everybody um, should have it too. Yeah, I was unable to locate that anywhere. Okay. All right. I can do that tomorrow morning. That would be awesome. Okay. Uh, what I was thinking in terms of board goals is let's see if we can come somehow craft uh, some some short-term goals for the superintendent between now and the end of the school calendar year in, in June. Things that we want to see as an SAU board uh, potentially delivered upon in this new environment. I think uh, that probably would be a great spot to start. Uh, specifically going back to, uh, I believe, one of my colleagues' comments about uh, remote students versus in-person students, making sure that there's uh, equal services delivered to those guys and making sure that assessments and uh, scoring or closely watched and monitored to make sure that no one's falling behind in that modality. And so if someone does fall behind, we're able to actually get those kids uh, uh, caught right up and, and, and quickly identified. Um, that's just like one idea or concept of a goal, but I'm going to open up the, the floor to discussion. Anyone have any quick uh, thoughts or, or concerns about uh, adopting some short-term goals between now and the end of this particular calendar year? I think Adam just shared the Google Doc. Great. I did send it to Abby. Thank you.
Did you share it with everybody? It's in the Zoom, Beth. Oh, thanks. I see it. I was looking in the email. Great. So what I'm going to ask is, is that everyone take a look at that, uh, the, the list that's actually in there from a time frame standpoint. Let's see if we want to go ahead and make any modifications or changes to that in light of the new COVID situation. And then uh, we can finalize and vote upon what those goals are going to be at the end of our September meeting. So I can ask that everyone, I mean, is this a joint uh, and we can go ahead and put a hard stop on edits, maybe put on a spreadsheet page two for ideas, things to change on that so we don't lose what's in the primary? Yeah, that's fine. Awesome. The last edit was made by Mr. Coughlin back on April 6th. Nice job, Josh. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Coughlin, any more questions about that? I don't have a mic down. That's almost good. No, no more questions. I just try to make sure that somehow I don't lose this. I'm trying to favor it or star it or otherwise make sure that yeah. when the chat goes away, I can still find it. Perfect. Awesome. So the ask there is, is that uh, between now and September, we go ahead and we uh, add a second page to that and uh, put in our feedback in terms of uh, goals. And we'll vote on that at our September meeting to uh, solicit and officially deliver to our superintendent between now and the end of this particular calendar school year. Laura Taylor, you have your hand raised? Uh, yes, I, I thought we could um, give some credit to the superintendent for all the work he's done for the reopening and yeah. the goals, which... Yeah. yeah, that's a great idea. Awesome. All right, seeing no other comments about that, uh, let's move on to the superintendent's evaluation. Uh, it's that time of year where we wanna go ahead and provide uh, feedback to the superintendent based on the previous uh, calendar year. Uh, and inside the packet is a copy of the evaluation form that's been approved by the SAU school board. But Ms. Kuzma, before I go too deep into that, uh, someone had commented that you guys were making adjustments or changes to that or were preparing to make changes to that for our next uh, policy committee? Uh, it was definitely one of the ones on the thing. Um, anybody that has it up, can you read the policy number to me? It, it, it's CBI. It was re we talked about changing it and then decided not to, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I was just going to verify that nothing was changed. Um, okay. Josh wanted to take a run at it and then uh, cooler heads prevailed and we left him alone. I think that's exactly what it was. Um, although that and the board one, they <laughs> get combined in my head. Um, okay, perfect. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a time frame on that. Um, let me move into... And just to confirm, there, I don't see any there's no edits okay thank you what i would like to ask is is that all board members print out that uh, form out of the packet and we can also push it out to you proactively uh, in the form of an email so it's isolated away but it's pretty easy to uh to, to, to print those pages from the pdf file and i'm going to ask that we submit those to your individual board chairs very similar to what we had done last year uh, for the reevaluation process and then the board chairs will go ahead and capture all of those uh, uh, comments and, 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 and feedback and then push that into me. And then we will review that at our SAU uh, meeting in, so, actually that's gonna be October. Let's see here, bear with me guys.
And I'm, I'm on a different Trello board page uh, for uh, the next part of the conversation. What is our October SAU board meeting date? October 29th, Mr. Chair. Uh, that's too late. So we will not do that. Um, let's try to do this for our September meeting. We'll go into non-public uh, non and review the recommendations. And so our September date, Mr. Superintendent, is the 17th? Uh, 14th. 14th. So let's go ahead and have those delivered before we'll get that Sunday. I thought we were, were we going to update the um, goals? Yeah, the go remember the evaluation is best based on the previous calendar year and the goals are proactive and forward looking. So it'll be in the next calendar year. Uh, yep. which is September through uh, July. So the evaluation period that we will be submitting to the superintendent prior to November 1st will be based on the previous calendar year. And so let's go ahead and have those delivered to your individual chairs by Friday the 11th. And then that weekend, I will uh, solicit those responses. And then we will talk about that on Monday the 14th in non-public. Any questions or concerns about that? See. Email Stephen to everybody with the form attached. Yeah, I'm going to do that uh, tomorrow. Okay. I mean, that's uh, perfect, just with the timeline as well. Um, but uh, the important thing is, is that we. <laughs> The important thing is we just get 100% capture. I know we did a great job last year. I would just love to go ahead and, and, and provide our superintendent with our feedback. I'm sure everything's gonna be glowing. Uh, we just wanna make sure that we provide uh, the proper uh, expectations based on our, our contract. Awesome. All right, let's uh, move on into the agenda here. Bear with me. And I got booted off Wi-Fi here, guys. Bear with me just a moment. All right, the next one is going to be just a quick reminder to our board members uh, uh, regarding a particular policy that we actually have uh, in each one of the districts and that's policy BHC with regards to a board member and staff and employee communications. Uh, this isn't directed towards any one particular individual, it's just collectively all of us as a whole. Just to remind us that uh, we need to refrain from emailing, CCing or corresponding with any employees directly. And uh, the context that I just want to frame this in is, is remember being a board member, we may not realize it, but uh, we don't want to uh, make a, an employee of our district uncomfortable about uh, us as being board members inquiring on a particular item or issue. All of our communications should be going directly through the superintendent. The superintendent then can follow up uh, on that email and forward that email to an employee for follow up. But we always want to remember to send our inquiries 
to one person and one person only, and that's the superintendent. Uh, I know uh, as a part of practice, my years on the board have always CC'd my chair. I think that's a great idea just so we are all staying in, uh, in constant communication with what we are inquiring about, what we're asking about. And remember, we're not uh, board members individually, we're board members collectively. So we wanna make sure that when we do communicate, we communicate in a professional way and do so through the proper chain of command uh, directly through the superintendent. Now, as parents, we can always go ahead and say, hey, I've got a question uh, for, for one of my school's teachers. I've got a question for the art teacher regarding an assignment. We, of course, wanna follow our board policy that stick, uh, specifically states how we need to address those types of concerns and questions. Again, directly to the teacher, then the teacher supervisor, and then the supervisor being the principal, and then bubbling it up that way. But remember, we don't wanna use SAU email addresses. We wanna use our own personal ones. And we always wanna preference that this is a personal email uh, from us as, as being board members. Um, just a friendly reminder, the policy has been in existence since the early 1990s. And we just wanna make sure that all of our employees are comfortable uh, and uh, there's no undue influence that's coming from us as, as, as board members. Um, Ms. Taylor, you have your hand raised? Yes. I wanted to know um, what kind of response we should expect and what kind of time frame from the superintendent. We, you got to remember that the superintendent's full-time job is running our school district, right? And so as individual board members, we, again, don't want to burden him with sending two, three, five, 10, 15 emails a day or a week. Um, to inquire as a part of our function as board members, Clearly the expectation is, is you know, uh, are, are, are you know, reasonable, right? So to say that uh, we send an email, we want that response same day, there's no emergency, there's no significant amount of follow-up that needs to be provided because there's a life safety issue. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's reasonable. And if it's something that you're uncomfortable with in terms of the response, you could bring it back to your individual board uh, and say, hey, uh, I'm having some issues with uh, responses from the superintendent, uh, it's taking too long and uh, you know, just uh, follow it up that way through the proper chain of command. Because again, we are not board members individually, we're board members collectively. And I'm sure that's never going to be the case. But uh, yeah, communication directly through the superintendent. Oh, you still have your hand raised. Yeah, I just, I want to know what my expectations should be on a response, positive, negative. I can't answer this question. Um, whether it should be a week, whether it should be a day. What is my expectation as a board member? I'm just curious. Yeah, so I can tell you what my personal expectation would be is, is within a week is fine. I don't think that's unreasonable. Um, if it's uh, the next board meeting, I don't think that's unreasonable as well because you know, as board members, again, collectively we're board members, individually we're citizens. And so the superintendent has a job and a job is to run our school district. And yes, he answers to the SAU board. Yes, he answers to us as collective board members and to our community. But remember, he should be running our school district, not responding to Steve O'Keefe's emails uh, on a daily basis. We wanna make sure that uh, he's empowered to do the things that, that he actually needs to do. All right, guys, that's, uh, that's it for, that's all I have on that particular issue. Just a quick reminder that uh, our policy does state that we need to uh, follow the, uh, the, the proper chain of command. Ms. Facey. Just wanted to thank you for bringing this up and I appreciated your response. Thank you. Uh, last item, and this is uh, kind of a fun one because I'm going to put the superintendent on, a spot, on the spot and it's 839 and we're kind of uh, well beyond my battery life of my headphones. So I had to switch uh, par partially through. I think that's going to be my new bellwether in terms of whether or not the meeting's going long if we're going to stay on Zoom. Um, and that's board uh, structures, uh, the meeting structure for the remaining part of the, the school year. Um, and my thought with this is, is that we're going to go ahead and we're going to solicit ideas and concepts from our board members about things and district-wide items that we want to review and discuss. And we're going to put them on the Trello board. We're going to actually map it out for the remaining part of the, the calendar year. To give you an example, um, one of our Amherst board members uh, is really interested in the concept of uh, based play kindergarten uh, and or play-based kindergarten. 
And having that up for discussion, it allows our SAU employees through the superintendent to be prepared for a pretty robust discussion. And that robust discussion can then be presented at a particular meeting that's scheduled in advance. And so that way we know that in our September meeting, which is still uh, on the board for a play-based discussion uh, for, for our kindergartners, uh, we're, we're prepared, we're ready, we're going into that meeting in that, that session to discuss that. And I want to solicit ideas from all my fellow board members to come up with some concepts for the remaining part of the calendar year, where I uh, will go through and, and try to pick. Uh, it, we probably won't be able to get to all of them uh, because there's going to be, I, I hope, a lot. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to try to spread it out uh, through, through the next uh, six to, to seven months. Now, the superintendent has actually created a Trello board uh, on there, and that's why I had that up earlier. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, would you uh, mind sharing that real fast and then just quickly addressing some of the ideas that you, you had in mind for us? The uh, SAU uh, Trello board? That's correct, sir. Okay, perfect. I have that up. Thank you. Uh, right awesome. Um, so there we are. Here is tonight on August 27th and all the things we've done tonight and then moving forward for the rest of the, the, the fiscal year. Awesome. And then you also have a Trello board set up with uh, the, the ideas for us to discuss. So one of them is going to be assessment. One of them is going to be play-based kindergarten. Oh, there it is right there. Perfect. Thank you. Mastery learning targeted. Like those are the things that we're going to potentially put into uh, our, our subsequent meetings. And so if play-based kindergarten is going to be signed for September 14th, I want to go ahead and capture an idea or concept that's important to us that we can then actually have our superintendent prepared to discuss at our October 29th meeting our November 19th uh, and so forth and so on. And so I'm gonna ask that if everyone can submit one or two ideas uh, to me, uh, and then um, you can feel free to CC your individual board chairs, and then we'll go ahead and we'll actually have that discussion at the four chairs meeting in terms of what we can implement in terms of a schedule. So everyone is on the same page and we can prepare for a pretty robust discussion on things that, uh, that are important to us. Mr. Superintendent, do you wanna add any further comments to that? No, I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful plan. Um, you'll note that uh, we, we went through and filled out what we know will be coming for future board meetings this year at the SAU level uh, and things that were um, long and coming. For example, the policy first reading for all of those policies we had scheduled for September, which is why the policy committee started their work and finished it in such a way that we would have it ready for the September meeting. Um, and you'll note that we added tonight appointing members of the public to the SAU budget committee. So that was something that came up tonight for the September 14th meeting. So we were using this to organize all of our work. The other, uh, a lot of these things are tied to uh, what we refer to as the big board, which is, uh, um, which is this board that has all of our annual processes, our five-year plans, and then the individual um, goals for the building and department level that we're tracking and, and keeping uh, mind of uh, on behalf of our school boards. So um, we, we hope to have this all be tied together and continue to be tied together so that um, anybody can go in here and, and see what we're working on and, and what the status is for these various projects we have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Great guys, and so I'm gonna ask just uh, over the course of the next week to week and a half, just go ahead and send me an email. Uh, with your thoughts, your ideas, and uh, we'll see if we can get that stuff added to our agenda for the remaining part of this uh, particular school year. Uh, any remaining comments with regards to that? Awesome, seeing none. Uh, let's move on to our part two public comment session. All right, I'm gonna to offer to the members of the public, the remaining uh, folks that we have, uh, the seven folks to go ahead and address the SAU school board. A re reminder that you'll be limited to a three minute comment period. And uh, Mr. Ballard, you are uh, the person that has the floor. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, uh, you asked how teachers were feeling. So as a teacher watching, I figure I'd weigh in here. Um, First, uh, all, everyone should know that teachers are very excited to see our students. It is uh, a lot of work we've been engaged in this week because we are completely redesigning uh, the, the method in which we deliver education and breaking some new grounds here, but we are looking forward to that. Uh, in the 
teacher subcommittee uh, of the, the, the employee subcommittee of your opening group, right, the number one priority that folks brought up was safety, and that is still a concern, uh, a safe workplace for teachers and support staff and a safe learning environment for students. And uh, going right alongside, uh, as Adam said, it is a range of emotions, but there's a lot, still a lot of concern about safety because for the past several weeks, when we've been asking questions, the most common answer is we're working on it. Um, so to be a bit of a squeaky wheel here, we are getting very close to the point which there will be no more time to work on it. Uh, the reopening plan and supporting documents made some assurances to teachers and parents that certain safeguards and procedures will be in place. And I'm worried that with so much tied up in DOE funding, uh, even if that request was approved tomorrow, we're not going to have all of those additional custodians we're supposed to hired and trained to implement the cleaning plan on day one. We're not gonna have the equipment for the outdoor classrooms, the hand washing sinks or the plexiglass dividers to help with social distancing. Um, in short, we may not have all the elements of our very good SAU 39 reopening plan in place when teachers and students walk in the doors next Wednesday. And it's asking teachers and parents and students to take a calculated risk that differs from the time they calculated that risk when they made their final decision. So teachers are very, very much looking forward to seeing our students. A majority of teachers chose in-person instruction. We want that interaction. We want things to be as close to the way as we can get them. But with less than a week until schools open, we really need to close the gap on these safety concerns so that teachers in Paris can focus on learning and providing the best experience for our kids and not be worried about safety and, and focus on the kids, which is the important part. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other comments from the public? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Superintendent, we do not have any public uh, or non-public session uh, comments, correct? That's it, that's correct. Great, uh, I will go ahead and uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, just one quick uh, final comment. Uh, you know, we started off uh, the meeting thanking all of our members of our staff and our employees, but as your board chair, I wanna thank you guys as well. Um, volunteering your time like we do to uh, to, to, to make sure that there's some guidance from the public with regards to our SAU, uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. And uh, I, if I were here in, in person to pat you on the back, um, I'd be patting you guys on the back because you guys are doing obviously a phenomenal job. Uh, keep up the work and uh, I'm looking forward to collaborating with you over the course of the next uh, uh, six months. Thanks guys. See you everybody.